Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the August 9th meeting of the Charles County Board of Education. Can we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, welcome back. Hope everyone is having and will continue to have a good summer. Uh, we'll start off with an update from the superintendent. Good afternoon, Board Chairperson Lucas, Vice Chairperson Wilson, Board Member, Staff, and those viewing today's meeting online. Today, I want to highlight several Charles County Public School safety updates, uh, excuse me, public updates. But first, let me say welcome to our first board meeting of the 22-23 school year. We have officially began in just two and a half weeks, but who's counting down? Uh, Charles County Public Schools will welcome back 27,000 students from summer break on August 29th. We kick off new teacher orientation on Monday and our dedicated force of about 2,000 plus teachers returns to school on August 22nd. I am eager to once again see schools filled with smiling faces of both our students and staff as they return to school. Before I get into the work underway for the new school year, I want to rewind a bit and touch on a few important highlights from this summer. First, I'm ecstatic to share that all high school seniors enrolled in the summer school program completed their coursework and earned their high school diploma. Last week, we celebrated the accomplishments of 75 graduates during a ceremony held at North Point High School, and I am so proud of these students for persevering and putting in the work to finish high school. Our elementary and middle school boost uh, summer programs were full of students this summer who were excited to receive additional instructional support over the summer break. Thank you to all the staff that worked this summer. Our free enrichment camps were heavily attended and continue into the next two weeks in August. While we encountered some minor hiccups, we safely and successfully transported all students to our summer programs for the very first time. I appreciate the support of our staff, administrators, bus drivers, attendants, and contractors who made transportation widely available to our families for our summer programs. I also want to publicly thank our food and nutrition services staff this Friday is the final day for our summer meals program. This summer, staff has operated nine serving sites and provided thousands of meals for children. Our staff also quickly adapted to a program change mid-summer when we learned we could offer meals through a grab-and-go service style versus requiring kids to eat on site. Thank you to everyone who helped children access food over the summer. From August 15th, through August 26, families can visit one of the four Charles County Public Library locations from 11.30 to 1.30, Monday through Friday, for grab-and-go lunches. Meals are available for children eight, ages 18 and younger. The Summer Meals Program is sponsored by Lifestyles, the La Plata Police Department, the Kiwanis Club, No, no Kid Hungry, and the Willis Group. Moving forward into the new school year, staff is busy preparing for the opening of schools. Again, the first day of school for students in kindergarten through grade 12 is Monday, August 29th. Students attending our pre-K um, program, which is now an all-day program across each of our 22 elementary schools, starts classes on Tuesday, September 6th. To any family waiting to hear about the pre-kindergarten program acceptance, please know that students who qualify under Tier 1 are placed first, followed by students in Tiers 2 and 3. Any pre-kindergarten program updates will be shared with parents in their Parent View accounts. Open house and orientation schedules for all schools are posted on the Charles County Public Schools website. At these events, parents can expect to learn more about their child's school, teacher assignments, and more. Please mark your calendars and plan to attend these events. Bus information and transportation updates will be loaded to our website the week of August 22nd. With any typical school year, parents should expect bus arrival and departure delays during the first few weeks of school. While I anticipate we will have all routes covered with minimal delays, I do want 
parents to prepare in advance and have a plan ready in case of any service interruptions. Parents should also check to make sure their child's immunization records are current. The Charles County Department of Health is hosting several back to school clinics in which students can receive free vaccines. Families can also re receive free COVID-19 vaccines and or boosters. For the, for, uh, for the coming year, Charles County Public Schools does not have any masking requirement in place for students or staff. Masks are optional for anyone inside our facilities. We do ask parents to please keep their children home if they are sick or exhibiting any symptoms of illness. This helps to prevent the spread of any illness in our school. Another important update for families to know about is the elimination of our Bring Your Own Device program. Students will no longer be allowed to bring in a personal device from home for instructional use. All students receive an assigned device from their school for learning. Our devices feature filters in which harmful internet content is blocked and teachers can also monitor device use in the classrooms. Students are, who are new to the school system should receive their device during the first we, uh, few weeks of school. And you'll hear a little bit more about this uh, in a presentation later today. Every family should also take time to complete a free and reduced meal application. Not only can students qualify for meal benefits, but the application provides additional incentives such as discounts on internet service, testing fees for high school students, and much more. The application is under our meals menu area of the school system website, ccboe.com. With the end of federal funding and grants that supported our ability to feed all children for free, for free the, system, the school system will return to a paid meal system this year. However, students who qualify for free meals through the meal application do not have to pay for food at school. I urge families to please complete this application as soon as possible. On today's meeting agenda is an update from our offices of teaching and learning and school administration and leadership. Staff will share information about important updates for the new school year, including how to plan to maximize tutoring programs to support students. All updates and news for the coming school year are also posted on our website. Please continue to visit our website and social media accounts for the most up-to-date information and back-to-school updates. I'm excited to partner with parents, staff, and the community to launch another great school year. Thank you for your support of Charles County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Navarro. Now we'll have time for correspondence from board members. I'm not going to look this way first. <laughs> From the new student board member, and yep. please tell everybody your name. My name's Amira Bujima. So, hello everyone. Today is my very first board meeting as the official student board member for the 2022 through 2023 school year. Today, I sit on this dais as a 28th Charles County student member of the Board of Education and the second student board member with voting rights. To sit up here today is a great honor and one I intend to hold with both integrity and humility. Last week, I had an opportunity to attend a three-day long event hosted by the Maryland Association of Student Councils. Throughout this event, I was able to engage with numerous student board members from all across the state of Maryland. One thing that mainly stood out to me was the large majority of students on their Board of Ed without voting rights. When I asked them to describe their relationship with their fellow board members, they claimed in quotations that they don't even care enough to look at them as they speak. This repel towards student leadership is surprisingly prominent across the state of Maryland. This experience has made me realize the opportunities I have sitting up here today, and I am undoubtedly grateful to live in a county that is slowly opening up and embracing student advocacy rather than rejecting it. I recognize the opportunity sitting here today reaps, and I will continuously use this to motivate me to strive to improve the lives of the students residing in Charles County. As I wrap up this board report, I feel it would not be complete if I did not express my gratitude to the past student board member, Ian Hurd. He has helped me tremendously with my transition as the next mob. From answering all of my questions in full detail to simply being an extravagant role model, I cannot thank him enough. The hard work and determination he put into his term truly embodies what student leadership is about, and I aspire to have the same passion and direction throughout my term as he did. Now, as I've said numerous times before, to sit up here today is an amazing opportunity, and I just cannot wait to get to work with my fellow board members. 
Thank you very much. Well said. Julie, it's been two months. Anybody? Ms. Brown. I'm glad to be back. On uh, July the uh, 12th, I did have an opportunity to go to Calvert County and participate in the Southern Maryland Equity and History Coalition meeting. And that was very informative because it told me all about the new thing that's going on with social studies. And one thing that impressed me was that the groups that were there were trying to make it easier for teachers in the classroom to access um, historical things to add to their curriculums. And one of the things that we did say was teachers are so busy, they don't have time to look up everything. So it's got to be an easy way for them to get things to add to their curriculum. So that is one thing that they were working on. And I did at that time get to um, tour the um, one room schoolhouse in Calvert County, the Drayden building. And that was also very informative. Um, I also had a chance to go to the science program at St. Charles along with Dr. Navarro. And I was impressed with the astronaut who spoke to the kids because he kept stressing to them that it didn't matter where they came from. In order to be an astronaut, it was more of they look at whether you can do the job. So that was something that they wanted to do. They would pursue making sure they were good in math, but that they could do anything that they wanted to do. And he told them how he came from the projects and he's an, he was an astronaut because that's what he wanted to do. I also attended the summer school graduation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Anything from anyone else? Nothing. Okay, I just have a couple of things. So, Ms. Brown mentioned the summer school graduation, um, and uh, Ms. McGraw was there as well. You know, hats off to those students. Um, you put forth the effort, and and you got your diploma. So good on you for that. And thanks to all the um, the teachers and administrators that uh, that work with them over the summer. Uh, so uh, we also several of us. Um, I think this is recent, at least for me. Um, we're at the retirement ceremony at North Point. Um, I think that happened after our last board meeting. So I just want to to thank and recognize all those people that um, that chose to spend their career with Charles County Public Schools. Um, special shout out to Miss Brown, um, former principal at Neal, who who I've known personally for for a long time, and I uh, hope you enjoy your retirement. And uh, the last thing is Dr. Navarro and I, um, we attended the, the fire and rescue cadet dinner at the Hughesville Fire Department. And thank you very much for, for putting that on. And if you don't know about it, that's a great program uh, where students can enroll and get their certification. Um, I don't know specifically which one, but, but both in firefighting and in EMS. And uh, there was a lot of sharp students there. and. Um, they are more than willing to help you um, get that done. And, um, you know, not only can you look at that to pursue as a career, but you're giving back to the community. So um, good on the students that, uh, that graduated from that. And thank you again for all the uh, our firefighters and EMS people in the county, um, not only for helping those students, but for what you do on, on a daily basis. All right, that's it for me, unless someone has anything else. So now um, we will not hear from the ACC, although Mr. Heil sent his comments um, to all the board members. Um, I don't know if those are posted on board docs yet, but if not, please make those available. Um, he is out of town, uh, but we will hear from uh, Ms. Birch from AFSCME. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Birch, president of AFSCME Local 2981. This summer, four members of Local 2981 and I attended the AFSCME 2022 International Conference in Philadelphia. Stacy Abrams from Georgia and Martin J. Walsh 
Secretary of Labor were the keynote speakers. We attended workshops in the afternoon and during the day covered many diverse subjects currently on everyone's radar. The economy, gas prices, women's rights were only a few that were covered. This Friday, I will attend the Leadership Institute at St. Charles High for Principal and Financial Secretaries. Last week, I received an email from a principal secretary at McDonough, Ms. Joycelyn Coates, called, asked me to call her. I called and Ms. Coates said she had talked to Mr. Howard in Human Resources and she knew there was no extra salary increase for receiving her degree from Liberty University. I told her to send the information to Mr. Howard and he would put it in her permanent record. Every time she receives an assignment or evaluation, the information is on that document. Then I had a better idea. I'm going to a secretary's meeting. I think they all need to know about her major accomplishment. On Friday, they will. Then I had one more idea. Dr. Navarro, the Charles County Executive Board, and anyone attending or watching this meeting need to realize how hard Mrs. Coates and all support personnel work to excel. If you see Joycelyn, congratulate her. couple of other folks. And Ms. Acton. So we are running just a few minutes early and one of our participants is not in the room. Uh, she has been called and texted or emailed and texted. So, uh, right now, Dr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that we're actually running ahead of schedule. Yes. Down. Nobody <laughs> bets on that. There we go. Uh, here she is now. She's coming through the door. <laughs> That's a good idea. She looks cool and, co and collected, so there's no, no panic. <laughs> it, wherever you want to sit, Kathy. That's fine. Is there one on, on the park? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. All right, let's get to jump in there. Jump in there. All right, so I'm going to take a, one of these and pass them down. Okay. See your name? All right. All right. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. And I'm Marvin Jones, Chief of Schools, as uh, my, my small team is all settled now. Yes, um, thank you all for allowing us to come before you today. And as I did mention, it looks like we're running just a few minutes early, so that's a good thing because uh, our brief presentation uh, may not be as brief as what we, what we hope. <laughs> <laughs> but hang on, let me grab the, uh, the clicker here. We, we will stay to the requested time frame from the board. Yeah. <laughs> Educators always on their feet. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, so yes, we are ready now to close out summer and prepare for the fall. Uh, the title of our presentation today we think is pretty appropriate. Um, we've been busy, busy, busy. Uh, lots of things going on, uh, but today we would like to uh, highlight and prioritize just a, a few of the things that we we believe that uh, you all and the millions of people watching today really want to know and so uh, we do have just a few things that we'd like to share um, I do have a small again a small committee here and uh, you can see their name place we have Ms. Cass Kathy Kiesling who is director of student services the chief of technology there Charmaine Thompson uh, beside her is Melissa Meisowitz she is director of secondary programs 
um, sitting in for Mr. Lowndes today. And then on the far end is Karen Acton, the chief, our chief financial officer. And we will, um, I believe we will begin. All right, let's, I believe Ms. Keesling, you're up as soon as I can get the, uh, Not how this is supposed to work. <laughs> okay. Mr. Hine, I think I might need your help. I'll let you uh, click the arrow that goes to the right. Well, I can go ahead and get started. We oh, don't need to. Yes. We don't, we don't ahead, necessarily right ahead, need this. I'm here to do some public service announcements for everybody. I want to remind everybody that our registration for students now open has been open and we're we're looking forward to our parents and encouraging our parents to get their students registered if they haven't already uh, we opened up six hubs this summer at various elementary schools to support the registration process because not all of our schools are um, employed with 12 month employees that do this full time so we wanted to make sure that we made it a little easier for parents to receive the support that they may need for online registration. So um, we have six different hubs open and we also trained some parent liaisons at our Title I schools that are there to assist parents when they come in. If they walk in and they need some assistance, they can get them at our Title I schools as well. Um, throughout the all the time we have at middle and high schools, our counselors and our data entry people are there throughout the summer at various times and they just need to, if parents need to register there, they can contact their schools for when those uh, personnel are available to actually help register at the schools. But our online registration, the information is, is up there on the screen for all parents. And certainly if you have any questions about registration at any time, you can always contact us in student services here at Central Office and we're more than happy to help you out. Um, again, we're encouraging parents to get their children registered as early as possible to help us for many different reasons, but one of the main things is um, anytime we have a new registration for a student that may need uh, transportation and we may need to establish a new bus stop, that can like end up trickling down and affecting all the other kids and times on those buses. So we wanna make sure that we get those in early so that our um, transportation department can be accurate, as accurate as possible on the first day of school for our students. So please make sure you are registering your kids. Next slide. We also want to remind parents about mandatory um, vaccinations. We have, uh, we partner with the health department to make sure that we provide immunization clinics for our students who need immunizations. And obviously parents usually keep up with those shot records and they get them into the schools, but there are times throughout the course of uh, a student's educational career that they may need some extra shots and parents need to be aware of what those are. So um, we have on our website, if you go to um, our website and just put in uh, uh, mandatory immunizations or vaccines it'll pop up and it'll give you a schedule of what vaccines your children should have at what age level um, it's under the parent tab as well on our website uh, these are some of the clinic dates if you need to have your children uh, vaccinated this is also on our website and you do need to schedule an appointment with the uh, health department in order to attend these clinics to have those uh, immunizations given some of the ones I want to remind parents of are when a child is moving up into the seventh grade, they need an extra Tdap and a um, meningococcal vaccine. Lots of times those are uh, not forgotten, but uh, they, they just, they don't realize that they need those extra shots. And so a student cannot start school unless they have those vaccines. Um, if they have an appointment, within the first 20 days of school, they can start school as long as they can show proof that they have that vaccination appointment. So if you get registered and you get that appointment scheduled and you're not able to get it until um, the beginning of the school year, you can take that information to the school and they will allow you to uh, send your child into the, into the building and they can be there, but it would be up to the first 20 days. 
if they don't have that vaccine within the first 20 days, for whatever reason, they don't make their appointment, the child will be, uh, the parent will be called to um, come pick the child up from school. So we wanna make sure that all our children are vaccinated and ready uh, when they get there. The other shot that um, we wanna make mention of is uh, kindergartners need a second MMR and varicella shot. So please make sure that if you have a kindergartner coming in, that they, they receive those vaccinations. Those are the two that we find many times are missing at the beginning of the year. And I think right. that's it. All right, thank you much. Mm -hmm. I do believe we're, yes, moving down the line, way down the line now, Ms. Acton. Uh, so um, what I wanna stress for families as we start the school year is that it's imperative that, that families fill out the free and reduced application it hasn't been necessary since the pandemic started because all meals were free, um, but that is not the case. So the history on what has happened is that um, when the pandemic started, USDA released waivers so that we could feed all the children, operate year round and feed all the children um, under the seamless summer option, which enabled us to uh, serve them for free and they could pick up the meals and all of those good things. Those waivers were extended until June 30th. Uh, we no longer can operate under that that um, program so the schools will return to the traditional pre-pandemic uh, service with families paying for schools meals based on their free or reduced or paid status fortunately maryland did pass legislation prior to the pandemic which reimburses school systems for the reduced meal price um, so what that means is that whether a family is free or reduced all of those families um, are free. They don't have to pay, which is great. Um, but it is necessary that they fill out the application. So stressing again how vital it is. Uh, we haven't had to do this, and so we wanna make sure that all families are hearing, and hopefully principals are hearing as well, that we need to encourage our families to fill out those forms. Um, the farm's percentages that after the applications are processed also determine um, our comp ed funding. So it's important for the school system that we get those forms in. It also qualifies some schools for additional meal programs. Um, free breakfast for all students if a school is over 40% farms. So it is very important that um, we get those forms and that the families fill them out. Uh, next slide. So the actual meal prices, we haven't changed those. Breakfast, and elementary school breakfast is $1.35, lunch is two eighty, and you can see there the reduced price for breakfast and lunch is zero. Secondary schools breakfast is one fifty, lunch three oh five, and again reduced and um, is zero. Milk is fifty cents for all schools. We will have a la carte as always available for kids. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. All right, good afternoon, board. I'm Charmaine Thompson, Chief of Instructional Technology. I just wanted to give you and families watching and students an update on the BYOD uh, program. In case you're not familiar with that program, BYOD was bring your own device. Uh, prior to COVID, we allowed students to bring their own laptops, iPads to school for instructional purposes. Uh, since COVID, we've been afforded the opportunity through local, state, and federal funding to purchase every student a device. Uh, the decision to sunset this program is because for many reasons. For one, is that we would be able to create more technical equity throughout our school district. Prior to uh, COVID, students who had a device would bring it to school. Those who didn't have a device did not have anything. This is allowing all of us to give every student a standardized device to do uh, school work on. Also, we only test digital tools and applications on school issued devices. So for instance, standardized testing, normally we have to install what MSDE requires for students to test on another device, a test in which why students had to go to a testing lab. Now that we're issuing them a device, we have that capability to do that versus them bringing their own device, not having that application installed and having going to testing lab. Um, also, all of our instructional applications are tested on our school issue devices, so it gets away from if a student brings in their own laptop, they don't have the application that they need for schoolwork, it, they can ensure that they have that standardized application on the device that we provide. 
We also uh, have implemented a new a classroom management tool which teachers will be trained on. It's called Land School Air. It allows teachers to more properly guide one-to-one -one classrooms. They can monitor screen time and not have to walk around the room to see what students are doing on their laptops. They can do all of that from their device. And lastly, I think this also helps us be good stewards of taxpayer money. If we've been afforded the opportunity to buy all students a device, I think we should be, we should be honest of that money and ensure that our students are using them, as well as ensure that we're um, filtering harmful content on the internet, which we already do, but we can do more filtering with the umbrella filtering that we're installing on the devices that we provide students. Um, so that's pretty much what that is. Um, there were some rumblings that made its way to me through some of our students thinking we were doing a cell phone ban. That is not what this is. Although our cell phone policy remains the same, students can bring their laptop on um, their cell phones to school, but they should remain uh, shut off and put away. At the high school level, they're allowed to use them in the cafeteria or during a special activity period, but nothing changes with our cell phone policy. It just will be enforced. So with us sunsetting BYOD, that's more so students bringing their own devices to school, such as laptops and um, iPads. Thompson, um, Ms. Meisowitz. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to talk a little bit about tutoring. And last year, we implemented high dosage, high impact tutoring. Um, this is uh, something that has shown to have large improvements on student achievement in the areas of both math and reading. High impact, high dosage tutoring tends to have some of the following characteristics that I've uh, listed for you up there a well-trained, consistent tutor, high quality instructional materials, one-on-one uh, -on -one with a student and a tutor in a really small group, uh, no more than four students to one tutor. It's embedded during the school day or the tutoring sessions are offered either before or directly after school. Uh, students receive at least three sessions of tutoring uh, per week and it's very data-driven. So um, with the federal relief money and, and funds, uh, we were told that we can use this money for tutoring and actually specific money was set aside for tutoring and only for tutoring. So this past school year, um, we used our funds to partner with two uh, companies, Amplify and FEV, and we're gonna continue to do so for this next school year. We started implementation um, in about March so we're really excited to start these tutoring programs at the beginning of the school year and hit the ground running. Amplify really focuses on reading and it's in grades four and five. Um, they embed their tutoring sessions during the school day actually in the reading block in elementary school. With FEV, um, they focus on grades three through eight. Um, there's a focus on reading and math and some schools offer their tutoring sessions during the school day. Other schools offer their sessions uh, either right before or right after school. FEV also has a homework help option, and I'm sure you've heard, we've talked about this before, um, and this is where we really need to advertise to our students. This homework help option is available 24 seven to students. It's support for students in grades four through 12 in their core academic subjects. Students can log on from home, from wherever they are, as long as they have internet access on their phone or any device. Uh, simply by going on to Clever. They, they log into their uh, Clever, they click on the FEV app, and they can connect with a tutor instantly for help in, on their homework assignments. So this past year, from about March on, we served over 2,000 students through approximately 1,100, 850 hours of tutoring um, services. So uh, quite a few hours of tutoring there. And we're looking forward to really expanding that initiative uh, this coming school year. So the next initiative is early college. And uh, as you know, we've talked a lot about early college as well. So we're very excited. Uh, we have about 75 students who will be starting uh, early college this school year from our four pilot high schools. 
and our first year of early college is a one year 34 credit program for students uh, in their senior year in grade 12 and like I said it's available in just those we pilot we're piloting at those four high schools next year the following year 23 24 we hope to expand that 34 credit option to all of our high schools um, in addition to that, we are working, we're currently in the development and planning stages for a two-year 60 credit early college associate's degree program for students starting in the 11th grade. And so that is um, really exciting, really exciting. So again, we're in the development and planning stages with CSM. Um, and then the hope is by school year 24-25, we'll be at full implementation, rolling out the one year 34 credit early college program for students in grades 12. So we'll have two years under our belt with that. And then uh, the two year 60 credit associate's degree program for all students. Exciting. <laughs> all right, so, so you've heard snippets about how we are keeping our students uh, healthy, how we are training them on their technology, how we are instructing them daily and planning to, how we're keeping them fed. And so none of that happens if we're not keeping them safe. And so that takes us to the last part of our uh, presentation here. And so um, safety, security, and discipline is what we want to share a little bit about. Uh, what we are doing, what we have been doing this summer, and then, uh, and then some concrete commitments as to what we, you know, how we're going to uh, do business beginning in the fall. And so just to share um, some of our current charts, some of the things that we have been uh, working on this summer, uh, revising and reviewing the Code of Conduct. That's an, an annual experience um, th that a small committee uh, made up of central office staff members and principals, uh, those who, who, who um, applied the Code of Conduct daily. Um, we work with that, that small group to, to, to really um, review all the ideas that we've heard, the concerns that we've heard, to review the, co the Code of Conduct every year and to um, you know, create the new document. And so we've done that, uh, reminding staff, students, and the community that the school system will address the most egregious acts with the most stringent consequence reasonable and available per the Code of Conduct. And so um, as you, you know, we, we heard lots of um, concerns and, and comments, and rightfully so, regarding um, discipline last school year. And so this has been um, an area of focus for us. Um, and so we are, we are looking to improve in this area. So this is something that we've been working on this summer, uh, ensuring that schools will develop a culture and climate strategy in this school improvement plan. Again, uh, work that we have been very purposeful about and uh, will be, and so, so there are our teams that will be meeting, school teams that will be meeting on uh, this coming Thursday, the first day of our Leadership Institute, to solidif solidify some more of that work, um, where we are uh, focused on our culture, our school's culture and, and climate. Uh, relaying clear staff expectations, something that we are talking with our principals about. Um, having teachers and staff to be visible and intervene in disruptions, but at the same time taking care of their own safety. Uh, we're not necessarily asking, particularly at the high school level where our, where our students are um, larger students than our, than our, than our uh, elementary kids, and um, altercations occur. We don't want any uh, of our staff members to be hurt, but we do want efforts to intervene, and that may mean just yelling or screaming or shouting, clap your hands, whatever it may mean, um, that's not necessarily some, some physical intervention. We don't want anyone to get hurt. Uh, we're not, not forcing that issue, but we do expect that staff will um, do what they can, preventative and in the moment, um, to, to, to minimize some of those disruptions or at least uh, reduce the, the, the danger there as much as they can, and to get help, of course. Um, holding, we are holding sexual assault prevention training for our athletic directors and our coaches, and we will be doing this for our staff. We've done this for the, the, the ADs and the coaches um, so far, but we are uh, doing that for all staff. There will be a, a part of our safety security road show um, will, that, that goes around to the schools. will include, this, this training will be included for, for all staff. Um, and then we're updating our social media policy, um, policy 1111, to prevent some of the concerns that we have heard about 
in the past that come by way of uh, inappropriate contact between um, adults and students. And so we are, are making sure that these are areas that we um, keep as a focus um, for all of our um, uh, staff and students. Uh, meeting with the sheriff's office, keeping our partnership intact. Um, uh, and of course, with our SROs, we're keeping the lines of communication open. Uh, we just had one of our quarterly meetings not too long ago with the sheriff's office uh, dis uh, discussing discipline concerns with the EACC and the uh, PAC group. And so we have had opportunities to meet with uh, both of these groups um, as we um, heard the concerns and began to establish what we believe will be uh, what I'll talk about on the next slide here in a moment, uh, our concrete com commitments. But hearing from members of the, the Parent Advisory Council and the EACC is pretty important to be sure that we are addressing uh, the things that need to be addressed properly. Um, so we are working in that area. Establishing communication um, to staff prot protocols during in-house emergencies. Um, this was a concern that, that came up that staff um, had a legitimate concern that when something was going on in their buildings, um, that whether it was a school had to go into um, a hold situation or whatever it was um, that staff wasn't necessarily hearing about some things um, and not all staffs but this was a concern that we heard that they weren't necessarily hearing about things that were going on in their buildings um, in the most timely manner and so we're, we're talking about protocols to ensure that staff is informed that uh, whether they get all the details in the moment staff is informed that something is going on that will be um, the information will be shared with them later in the day or what have you, but um, some protocols that we heard um, were, would be helpful, um, and, and we agree with that. Uh, we are working on helping administrators to discern when shifting from grace to accountability is appropriate. And so I talk about this a little bit because um, you all likely heard a lot last year about how um, we were asking our administrators to show grace uh, to our students as they returned to school after having been out for a while. And while that was absolutely true, um, having the best of intentions, you know, it appears that in some instances, the extension of grace um, perhaps may have gone on uh, too long or, or perhaps um, had gotten to a point where um, th th there was cloudiness between showing grace and you know, not holding kids accountable. And so, so we are working with administrators to be sure that uh, we are being reasonable, but at the same time, we are holding students accountable. So um, things that we think were um, worth um, our time and effort to, uh, to be working on this summer, and so we have been. And so then moving forward, um, some of the concrete commitments that, 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 that we are committing to, I guess, um, uh, areas that we've shared with the EACC as well. Uh, improve the communication with teachers um, with regard to when students um, have a disciplinary action that is addressed in the office and when they return to class. Um, we, we've heard from staff that um, there are times that students return to their classrooms and uh, students who had some sort of behavior violation and teachers are wondering what gives. They go and they come back and I don't hear anything about what, what happened. And so we, we hear that and so we think that we can improve in that area of communication with um, our staff so that they do understand the administrative perspective, whether they always agree or not. Um, that, that, that's something that we would have to you know, look at individually, but to be sure that there is good communication there, we think that that piece is important when administrators are dealing with um, you know, uh, disciplinary concerns. Um, ensure that teachers are made aware of the disciplinary action. Again, um, uh, what may have happened, um, those first two sort of tie together. Expanded supports and professional learning opportunities for uh, classroom management. So we recognize that this goes hand in hand with some of the disciplinary concerns that we have. Um, ensuring that our staff is you know, um, trained up well on, on how to manage th their students. And so, uh, so those are opportunities that we uh, will be expanding as well. Um, holding weekly school safety meetings with administrators. Uh, we did do that last year. We will continue that. It's a virtual meeting that we have with our administrators every Thursday. And so this is something that we are, are committed to uh, and, and, and having our administrators to participate in those meetings. Again, um, we, we think we share really good information in those meetings and timely um, because it's a weekly um, meeting. Uh, being receptive to teacher and staff perceptions about discipline. Uh, we will, and this hasn't been hashed out, but we will um, make efforts to have more regular kinds of 
uh, pulse check meetings with our, our association, with our EACC, uh, perhaps on a quarterly basis. Uh, we, again, we haven't hashed that out, and Mr. Hiles not here today. Um, but, but, but we do think that hearing from the EACC on a more regular you know, kind of basis and having some joint discussions about how we, how we um, address these areas, how we keep these areas um, high priority, we think that's, that's going to be important for us to keep that dialogue going. And so, um, so we will, so we will be um, receptive. Um, and soliciting student voice and input, um, we, we, we did have these monthly meetings last year with the sheriff's office where there were high school representatives from each school that met with us at the different schools. And so uh, we think that's something that's worth keeping going. And whether it's the SGA representatives or it's other school representatives um, from, you know, from, from their buildings, um, and some of them may even be in the room who participated, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I see some, my guy from Thomas Stone over there. Um, so so th those meetings we think were pretty valuable to hear from the students, um, you know, things that they were concerned about regarding safety in our schools and to take that information back and share it with our administrators. And so, again, another, um, another thing that we are committed to uh, prioritizing this school year. So, so the things that we are doing and the things we're planning to do, um, we believe is going to set us up for a good start. Um, to the school year and then um, again keeping these things as high priority certainly these are not all of the things that we will be doing uh, but with the time that we had we thought we'd highlight the things that would you know that, that would be uh, good for our, our community and, and and of course our board to to hear and know um, what we are, are looking at as some of our uh, top priorities moving into the school year with regard to safety security and um, discipline so that was a lot, um, a lot of information in, in perhaps a little bit of time. Maybe we did better than I thought. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, but, uh, but we are open to taking questions at this time. Um, yeah. and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. And, and, and I'm sure my fellow board members do have some questions and some comments. But it's a very good presentation. And I think you hit on, on some high points that, that not just the board, but the um, the public has been asking about and it's good that um, you know we're being open and transparent and setting expectations uh, for the next school year so thank you very much yes mr. Hancock thank you chairman Lucas thank you all for that presentation I uh, greatly appreciate it um, probably not a real shocker I'm gonna um, <laughs> have some questions about school safety security and discipline uh, dr. Jones um, with um, the um, sunsetting of the bring your own device um, which was also mentioned here and it was also mentioned that the cell phone policy isn't going to change um, so it's no surprise to you but it seems like as of late a lot of the disciplinary issues we have had later in the, the latter part of this school year and even recently in summer school have revolved around cell phone in, in one way or the other um, someone had their cell phone stolen from them with a with a with a look-alike gun um, used to do that seems like fights break out when someone has an altercation and they text their friends and then, a, then it's a big giant ordeal uh, and it's and, and people get severely injured um, I'm not a proponent of saying we don't need cell phones at all in school however I do believe that a cell phone is having a cell phone in school is a privilege it's not a right and um i just i guess i i'd like for you to if you could uh, specify um now especially with the bring your own device sunsetting where they're going to have their own school issue devices the students um when is the appropriate time for a student to use their cell phone uh, i know miss thompson had touched on it a, a little bit and then what repercussions um would a student face for violating the code of conduct in regards to cell phone use. Sure. Thank you. Yes, um, so the cell phone conversation is most certainly um, a big conversation that, that we will likely take up again at a later time, um, the cell phone policy. Um, but um, as it stands right right now, we, as Ms. Thompson mentioned, we, we're not looking to, to, to change it. So at the elementary level, and this is really general, at the elementary level, they, they really aren't permitted to bring them unless there has been some approved permission to, 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 to bring them. And at the middle school, they should be, I think they can bring them, but they have to keep them powered off and out of sight, maybe in their lockers. Um, and then the high schools, they um, can have them 
off again, um, but I think out of sight on their person. And then there are times that they are permitted and the times that you alluded to that they are permitted to use them uh, are during their, their lunch times. Um, and if there are special activities that the administration has approved, um, then they may, may use them then. Um, that's the, the times they are legally um, able to uh, allow to use them. Um, we are understanding that students often will have them out and using them at uh, times they're not permitted. Um, and that has been a challenge, um, an acknowledged challenge um, to really uh, um, address uh, because, again, it, there was a time a long, long time ago where maybe a few students had a cell phone and now you will have a school of 1,700 students with 1,700 cell phones. And so it's, so it's, um, it's a challenge to, to really monitor as, as closely as what we may like. The reason why it, it probably will be a discussion at a later time is because um, it was written at a time when it was just sort of becoming a thing and now it's a bigger thing. So, so we may you know, go back and talk about if there are some revisions that may need to be made to it. Uh, but, but when the violations do occur, uh, reasonable, reasonableness is expected that, our, that the students will be, you know, progressive distance students will be such told you must put the cell phone away. It cannot be out. Um, you know, reasonable warning should be given. And then at some point, um, they, they should be compensate, uh, confiscated. But, and then, you know, a phone call made for the parent to come and pick it up, um, I, I believe is how the, the um, uh, uh, consequences are listed in the code of conduct. Um, and so those are, are situations that we try, try, try not to get into because everyone knows just how much of a power struggle you will have, um, whether you're polite about it or not, uh, when you go to collect the cell phones. And so we're also asking our administrators to think a little bit, uh, administrators and teachers, to think a little bit outside the box as well, knowing kind of what, what situation we have. There are some places that have these really unique um, plans or, or agreements that, you know, every cell phone goes in a manila envelope and it's stapled and it's put on a desk or, you know, um, so sometimes there, there are these things that, that work, these tricks that work for some teachers. And so we encourage our staffs to really consider those things, again, knowing the battles that they are fighting um, and at the same time not wanting it to get to a point where you're, you're considering suspending a student for a cell phone. We, we, we never wanted to get to that point. But honestly, there are some times when we probably get close to that point, closer to that point than we really want to, especially when, and this is when it is something that we support, a suspension or something that affects us when they're taking them out and they're, and they're videotaping uh, the fights and they're, and they're you know, sharing them or whatever it is. And that sort of thing, it's, it's, it's gone really too far. And so, um, so there are some things that, that we're having some really clear and direct conversations about. And then there's some... Uh, things that we're asking our administrators to think creatively a little bit and, and try to meet our students halfway where it's reasonable to do so. Um, just because it is a battle that if you um, truly went to go and, and uh, address every single cell phone issue, um, is that the best use of our time? So we, so we have to be reasonable about it, um, about how we do it, knowing that we have other, many other priorities. And so, um, but, but we do have to address it. We, we can't just let it go. It does have to be addressed, so. Thank you, Dr. Jones. And that's, it's just something that jumps out at me, especially just seeing how far, a, you know, using your cell phone in class kind of sounds minimal, and, but it can lead to, and has led sure. to some, some severe damage, um, has been a part of the problem anyway. Um, but it is good to see, um, school safety and security to be listed, uh, listed here and to be discussed. I know we talk about teacher retention all the time and um, I've had um, teacher friends of mine flat out tell me, you know, we focus a lot on the economical side of it of paying her teachers, but some no teacher wants to work in a classroom where they don't feel safe right. and you can't put a price tag on that and we we really have to we we need to realize that that's a part of the problem it's that is a big part of the problem of retaining and finding teachers is discipline and not feeling safe yes teachers need to be paid what what they deserve they also need to be treated the way they deserve to be treated by uh, everyone in the school building. Um, so thank you for, for addressing that. Thank you for answering my questions and thank all of you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Ms. Wilson. Um, 
very timely, excellent presentation. Um, a, a number of uh, newspaper articles are starting to come out about the importance of getting ready for school and the vaccinations and the various types of vaccinations uh, in addition to the changes to the lunches. And that is something um, with the economic um, situation in the country, we need to kind of keep an eye on delinquent lunches. I know that it's the beginning of the school year, we're not there yet, but I'm sure Dr. Navarro um, that is, and the principals will closely monitor uh, because we all know how important it is for our children to have uh, nutritious meals. Um, I'm glad that we're having this discussion about um, the use of cell phones and it's ironic one of the things um, that I wanted to emphasize and highlight um, because it's nothing, nothing about it is glamorous and is certainly nothing that we need to celebrate is the posting of videos from students of bad behavior and anything that we can do to enforce um, and to ensure compliance um, we, we need to do, do so because I just, I think it personally, it's horrific to watch uh, any student um, to be attacked um, by fellow students. Um, it's just unacceptable and anything that we can do to kind of discourage that and promote the positive behavior um, is absolutely encouraged. Um, I'm, I'm always in admiration of in the entire staff for all of your hard work but I have to tell you, I'm very intrigued with the logistics of issuing every student in Charles County Public <laughs> Schools their own device to include the maintenance. I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just scratching my head about that is quite, I mean, there are many accomplishments in each of your areas, but that is, I think, shows how successful we are um, as a, a school district. And I, I know earlier we mentioned about orientation. Um, and so there's a lot of great information I'm sure is gonna be reiterated at these orientations. Um, but I also like to uh, emphasize the engagement of our PTSOs. We, it's, you're sharing what we're doing as a school system, but we need the parents and people in the community and anything that we can promote and support our, our PTSOs and anybody that wants to step up in those step up in those roles and anything that we can do to uh, encourage their success and give provide supports. We'd love to hear any words of uh, wisdom. So thank you for the thank you for the wonderful briefing. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Wilson, Ms. Battle Lockhart. Thank you all for your presentation. Um, I have a few. Couple slides I want to address. Um, school meals. I just want. I know we talked about it's been a long, long, long time. Is the form application? Is it electronic now? Is it electronic? We're we're still using handing them out at the school. Okay. Um, okay. The reason why I bring it up is because, um, especially now more than ever, um, with COVID and everything, we have families that are not that this is a new situation for them and to come forward to have to fill out an application sometimes is some of the reasons why they don't fill out the application to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. But um, I just want to publicly just say, um, it's only to support you to ensure that your, your kid is being able to eat and be healthy on a daily basis. But I encourage us to get to a point where that form can be um, filled out electronically because I believe that you'll see more parents be more open to filling out the application because sometimes it just sheds a little different light on if it's never been an experience of yours before um, as people have been affected by COVID <laughs> and salaries are looking different so I just wanted to address that but I do encourage parents if you can just make sure um, you take advantage of it. We're not trying to, you know, we don't put your name on blast or anything like that. We're just trying to make sure your baby gets food. Um, the other part of this is, as um, Ms. Wilson said, um, as it relates to not so much to bring your own device, but the cell phone piece, I think we should work closely or kind of bring 
the um, parents in the loop as it relates to bringing the parents during orientation, but even during the PTO, with the PTO leaders to support in, and I've mentioned this before too, is how we can advocate for them if the kids are in the understand because of all the craziness that's been happening nationwide at the schools. Um, I specifically have my daughter on screen time. So during school hours, she can't be on her phone during their screen time because I have it locked out, but she can contact me if something urgent or her dad if some urgent or those key people, but she sh can't talk to her friends back and forth during school. So I encourage you all during orientations, maybe hand out the Android version of how to set that up, the <laughs> Apple version of how to set that up. That's how we get the parents involved and help hold them accountable to um, supporting us in this journey of making sure that they're focused solely on learning um, and of course enjoy for the high schoolers doing their appropriate time to utilize their cell phones so I just really want to continue I'm gonna keep bringing it till I get out the seat that screen time works <laughs> um, it's just a matter of some parents don't know about it so we don't educate them they can't support us so I offer that up to you um, the tutoring piece, I had a question because you made a statement that we're going to continue to work with that. Um, do we have results and data to support how successful has, it has been for us? Um, yes. That would be some, I don't, we don't have to talk about numbers now, but maybe some, in the item later on to see so we can know that this is really working to highlight it to the parents and the community and the kids to say, oh, this really does work and maybe I should take advantage of it. Maybe we're not having enough students take advantage of it because of hearsay, say so, and experiences from other um, online programs that we weren't so successful with. Mm -hmm. So I would love to, hopefully they would like to know it as well. Yep, we can absolutely send that to you. Mm -hmm. And um, I, was down, I was writing up a storm, I'm sorry y'all. <laughs> um, I had a question, of course safety and security was a big area. Um, When are we, my daughter asked me 24 seven, when, are, when is the student IDs coming back? They are coming back this year. So um, they, Life Touch is in the process of updating the pictures on those IDs and shipping them out to our schools. So they will be back. Um, so they will exist. Yes, we are very hopeful that we'll have them prepared to hand out the first day of school. Okay, and on your list, we talk about safety and security. I felt we're missing something holistically. We're not talking about the elephant out there in the world. <laughs> um, and the safety as it relates to how we're going to approach as we're talking about preparing for going into fall. Um, continue safety and cleanliness for COVID, monkeypox, whatever, the everything pretty much. As well as um, we, you didn't, don't, Eventually, we, I would love to hear it. Um, the approach on drills, where the, whether it's active shooter, fire, weather, whatever the case may be, what's the plan? Where are we in that piece? I know um, our friend is not here, but that's a part of holistically approaching safety, security, and discipline. All of that should fall in there, and I didn't see hear you all address No, that. You, you're right. You did not hear us talk about it, but those are things that are a part of what we're doing as well. Yes, so um, we can certainly share that at another time if uh, so desired. Okay, thank you. Ms. Battle, like, may I interject about that point sure. specifically? Um, so before the year ended, the board did request a quarterly just safety update uh, in a variety of forms. As Dr. Jones mentioned, we can, um, as the board wants, give an update on those, but we will be sending those quarterly updates. Um, I, last year, uh, we missed on, on completing some drills um, that were uh, required drills. Um, Jason Stoddard is going to oversee that process this year. It, it makes sense through his office uh, in conjunction with other offices to make sure that we don't miss that and that we continuously monitor to make sure that you know, the, the reason drills are in place is so that people practice certain um, behaviors in case of an emergency, whether it's a weather emergency or other emergencies. And so we will get back on that schedule. Okay. And last um, question is in regards to solicit 
teen um, student voice input feedback. How is that going to be uh, information going to be captured and reported back to us to ensure that their voice is being or issues are being addressed overall holistically? Well, we can certainly talk about what that looks like as far as bringing it back to uh, the board. Um, what we have been doing is capturing that information when we met with those students and taking it back to the administrators um, because it was mostly talking about how they felt safe or didn't feel safe in their schools and what you know kinds of things that were um, important to them. And so we did at that time take it back to the administrators and say, here's something that we're hearing from our students mm -hmm. and, um, and allow the administrators opportunities to address those matters. Um, yeah. We did that very specifically. Yes, um, but, but moving forward, we certainly can, you know. And I'm not saying specifically the school, like a, we have to know what school, what mm -hmm. students said, right. but holistically over this quarter, we've spoken to this amount of students sure. throughout these schools and these are the bigger priorities that keep repeating themselves. Sure. At least that way they know that we're hearing and we're holding accountable just as much as y'all, you guys hold them accountable to making sure that their needs or challenges or even ideas are being implemented. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if I, I'd like to speak up. Um, this year, we are going to be instituting a, um, a system-wide for our secondary students. A, it's called Baseline Tool. It's through our base education program. And it is a survey, basically. It, it will, um, it, for every student, will have the opportunity to take it at the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, and at the end of the year um, to give us information and feedback about how they're feeling about many different items in their educational careers, one of them being safety, how they're feeling. So it's a pretty generic questioning uh, tool, but it is something that we wanted to get that feedback from our students. And um, our high school and middle school students will have that opportunity this year. We're going to look to see about elementary, but sometimes it's difficult with elementary to ask them certain things. So um, this will be universal for all of our secondary students this year. We'll okay. be rolling out. Thank you all for you. Well, Ms. Battle Lockhart, I just wanted to uh, mention one thing worth noting. Uh, last year, I did offer, I did a series called Tech Talks. One of my Tech Talk series was keeping your children safe online. It wasn't well attended, but I'm going to be doing those next year where I literally was talking to parents, how to do settings on their child's phone, different programs they can use to monitor what they do at home on their cell phone. I also partnered with Charles County Government. I did a podcast session on keeping your children safe online. Those were recorded. I also provided guides if you had an Android or you have an Apple device. So again, and even back when I first started in 2017, 2018, I, part I partnered with the state attorney's office doing uh, safety scenarios and how to keep your children safe online as well as with the FBI office. I'm gonna continue to offer those, help get the word out. They not, they're not always well attended and I really wanna get the word out to parents because it's very important. I'm a mother, I have three children and I know what it's like how managing a child with a cell phone. Mm -hmm. They're going to be on it, there's dangers there and I want our parents to know how to keep their kids safe. So. I'm welcome to suggestions on how to get more attendance to these. We did webinars, podcasts, in person, recorded them, pushed it out. I just don't know if I'm getting the traction that I'd like, so I just wanted to put that out there. So if you don't mind, um, is there a way, I don't know, maybe this is a cow question. <laughs> um, is those videos, because they're recorded, are they able to be um, added on our YouTube channel? That way we can refer parents to that because they come here to watch here yes, all day long absolutely so the it podcast. would be great to be yep. able to do that as well Just and we are building a new website as well well we've already built it we're going to be posting them there as well the charles county government site that i partner with they posted them and those podcasts are there for the community to view but you know they come here first. i know yeah. <laughs> but we're, we're going to get better about it to get the word out more because that is a concern i know a lot of parents have yeah so and actually you. as well as community-based organizations those videos at least we know if we know where they are we can say hey we and we can share those as absolutely well. we'll do that thank you and i just wanted to clarify the farms application is available online but and it has been for about five years but we did not want to make a change this year to go completely online since it's so important that we get all of the forms this year. So we kept the process the same, which is the paper is available. You can do it online as well. But we haven't made the switch to be 100% online. Gotcha. I was afraid to take a chance when we need all those applications. But it is there. Okay, great. That's good. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, Ms. McGraw. 
Well, I just want to quickly add that I think today was very informative, and thank you all very much for the information that you've shared, because I've come to learn a lot of individuals watch these uh, our meetings, mm -hmm. and if they they can refer back to the meeting either through watching it again or looking on board docs for this information because starting with you um miss kiesling the registration piece is so important i um you know often wonder why parents wait all summer long until that last day before or the day of school to register but you know it was very clear that they can register now and any time up to you know the first day of school uh, it's also all the rest of the information also is extremely informative in terms of uh, explanations for why we're doing certain things especially with the bring your own device um, why why are we not why is it sunsetting and you made it very clear why but it did bring up to me m one of the questions that I had was cell phones and you you answered that question but I would like to concur with uh, my colleague um, mr. Hancock in that <clears throat> It, it brings up more problems. Uh, you know, there's a lot of issues surrounding it. And Mr. Jones, uh, Dr. Jones, I clearly heard you say we will look at it. But I really think we should look at it um, in terms of at least reiterating what, um, what should be enforced at each level. Because I personally do not think that that's happening. It was at elementary school, and I know it's not happening in middle school because of personal contact <laughs> so you know if, if we were to enforce uh, at each level what the expectations are for cell phone use um, from an administrative point perhaps there would be less incidences um, and also in terms of free and reduced um, applications and why we are not providing lunches this year there's been a lot of chatter on social media about why can't we but I think what you had to explain today made it very clear why we cannot continue with that practice and not to leave you out Ms. Mess was <laughs> um, I learned something today about the tutoring that took place I was not aware of what was available for our students so that's another resource that our parents can refer back to that I'm very you know pleased to hear about last but not least dr jones you briefly mentioned the safety and security road show what's that <laughs> yeah. so so mr stoddard and his team will be going around to each of the schools and doing a um, sort of at their staff meeting just sort of update on um, all of the different things that they need, need to be aware of regarding um, safety and security the newest um uh, items uh, topic items I guess um, and I thought I brought a copy with me in case this did come up um, and those items that uh, we are initiatives that we are working on with our um, schools um, the crisis manager app um, that uh, uh, school to, uh, I'm sorry uh, staff should be made made aware of um, the alert us interactions that are shared with team the 911 text alerts uh, the emergency procedure book um, topics that will be discussed the door stickers um, uh, classroom keys, 911 radio, safety committee chairpersons. That, so there are lots of, of topics, safety and security topics that will be discussed um, at this um, at the, the, the road shows as they go around to different schools. Um, but one of the, the one that I highlighted, the big one there, is the um, sexual assault prevention um, training that will be a part of that as well. So it's for staff. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all very Mr. much. Mr. you don't mind, I wanted to address the point that you both and Mr. Hancock brought up in reference to BYOD and the cell phone. While sunsetting BYOD is not going to totally um, meet the issue we have with cell phone, I think it will help. The reason administrators didn't have a leg to stand on to totally enforce our current cell phone policy is because of BYOD. Mm -hmm. Students were like, well, I have my phone out because I'm researching or I'm studying. Well, really, behind it, it's Snapchat. Behind it, it was Instagram. Mm -hmm. Because we're sunsetting BYOD, it takes away that excuse for that student to have that, lap that phone out in the classroom. So again, while sunsetting BYOD is not gonna totally uh, eliminate the cell phone issue, I think it gives a leg for administrators to stand on to say there's no reason for you to have it out in class. So that's just to elude why I mentioned that in my um, update. So now we ramp back up the consistency Correct. on how it should be addressed. And so that's the plan. Good, thanks. Very good. Thanks. Any, any other comments? Um, or liaisons? Hey, please tell everybody your name again. What school you're from? Hi, my name is Leslie Johnson. I'm from St. Charles High School. I have 
have no doubt that this program will eliminate a lot of gray areas, but speaking from personal experience, I mean, I'm always a student that tries to be the most respectful, but something I was always confused on is, say you have your phone out, or say we're at an orientation and I'm asking you this question, you're explaining like, what would dis reasonable, reasonable disciplinary reactions from a teacher to a student, if a teacher were to ask you to give them their phone, give you their phone, oh, you have your phone out, give it to me, I'm going to give it to somebody else. If a teacher were to ask me that, I would say no and put my phone away. Would I have to give my cellular device or any device to a teacher if they request it? Or is it like my right to hold on to it? <laughs> <laughs> well, so what we would ask the teachers to do is, the, the, the first request shouldn't be, give me your phone. The, the first request we would say, put the phone away. You know you shouldn't have, I mean, you know, whether they say it nicely, however they say it, we would expect that, that at least there be some effort to allow the student an opportunity to correct the problem, which is really to, to turn the phone off and put it away. Um, and so that's, right then, that's where it begins to be problematic when the student doesn't comply with that direction. If the student is compliant on the first request to put the phone away, in most cases, we move on. We don't, we don't have a problem. So what you're talking about typically happens on the second time around or the third time around, you know, I've asked you to put the phone away or they put it away and they pull it back out later and the teacher may come back and say, okay, you know what, give me your phone. You are supposed to turn the phone over at that point. Um, we understand that it is your property, but the teacher is not um, asking for your phone to keep it for their personal reasons. They are asking you for the phone because it's a, it has become a disciplinary matter. Um, in the end, you will get your phone back. Um, that, you know, that they certainly have no, no reason to, to keep it, no, no, no plans to keep it. Um, but when they ask for it, yes, you are supposed to give it to them at that point with the understanding that, yes, you will get it back. Um, what that looks like, it, it sort of depends on, uh, um, you know, how many times that has happened or what have you. If the, if the next step is to give the phone to the administrator, you get it from the administrator, or the next step is to hold the phone until we call the parent to come get it. Either way, the, you are supposed to answer your question, you know, is it my right to keep it? You are supposed to hand it over when they ask for it. What I would suggest is let's not get to that point. Um, lastly, as a revisor, I realize when you have a situation or a rule is like reasonable in all scenarios for one solution to happen, it kind of eliminates gray areas. Would a possible or a proposable solution be that you get a ref on those multiple warnings you the teacher goes to an administrator or gives an email or some type of referral and then a higher up authority figure comes and they either call you to their office at some other point or they take your phone because a lot of times like i wouldn't i would, if a teacher asked me to get on the phone i would just put it in my purse and then if i get a referral i don't because i've heard that if they give your phone to the office a teacher a parent has to come pick it up and my mom would not pick it up so i would just say maybe if there is a like consultation afterwards that could resolve a lot of like power struggle as far as a teacher saying oh the first time it's my class give me your phone and, and, and some of that is spelled out in the code of conduct as far as what the progressive discipline would look, look like and getting an office referral is you know can be a part of that process for sure um, but certainly I think that hearing you know your voice and the student perspective you know when it's time to have those discussions again uh, will be important and so so you know whether our, our cell phone policy needs to be changed um, you know certainly we, we won't be changing anything this year um, it will be a topic of discussion to ensure that we are you know planning guidelines that make the most sense uh, but but as it stands right now there are some very specific kind of uh, consequences that that should be rendered when you know you're when you have a cell phone violation they're spelled out in the code of conduct as well uh, referrals can be a part of it Parents not coming to get it, I understand it, I've heard that before. Parents have said, yeah, I'm not coming to get it because you shouldn't have had it out. And so, again, um, I encourage all of our students not to get to that point. So, so easier said than done, I, I get it, but that is where we stay. Board members, any other comments? 
So I just have uh, a couple of things. And again, thank you all. And thank you, board members, for good questions. Um, again, following up on, on what Ms. Battle Lockhart said, if you're eligible for a free and reduced launch, please fill out the form. Um, no one is going to know that, that your son or daughter is, is receiving that. The, the, the process for, for getting the launch is the same as if you were drawing out of your account. So, so none, none of their classmates or none of, no one else in the school is going to know that. And this is coming from a kid that, you know, back in the Stone Age when, when, <laughs> when I was that kid, you had a little slip of paper and you handed it to, to the cashier. And so everybody knew what was going on, but 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 that's not the the case now. So um, you know there there shouldn't be anything uh, to worry about as far as your kid, and just with discipline in general, um, um, you know, for all the, the the teachers listening out there, um, you know, there 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 is a code of student conduct, and and the expectation is that um, it will be followed and. This board supports what you do in this classroom, and certainly the superintendent does. So, um, you know, kids, the overwhelming majority of kids want to be there to learn, and obviously um, all our um, educators want to be there to teach kids. And um, uh, as, as Mr. Dr. Jones so eloquently said, we, we gave a lot of grace, and, and we, but we need to make sure that our kids are learning and that um, our educators feel safe. So. Please just know that, that we support you and we've got your back. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. <laughs> Ms. Acton. Yes. Um, so on your docs, I have the uh, chart that was previously approved at the June meeting, which was for the daily and hourly wage rates. And we have one request uh, for a change that we had accidentally not raised the home and hospital teacher rates. And we're asking that um, we be given approval to raise it from 25.25 to $30 an hour, um, which is the, the equivalent rate to the ELO and the Title I tutor with a bachelor's degree or higher. Any questions? Any for questions me? from board members? Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. That was easy. Thanks. All right. So this time we're going to take a little break. Uh, Let's come back. Um, let's come back at 240, please. 240. Okay, welcome back, everyone. We're going to continue with our meeting. Next up is Mr. Heim and Mr. Andrus. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I am joined by Steve Andrus, who is our Director of Planning and Construction. And we have three items uh, to report and share information with the, with the board today. The first item is the project status update. This is a monthly report that we give to the board. Uh, it was downloaded to board docs for public viewing. Uh, so we will entertain any questions with that. I will uh, remind staff that the second item uh, that we are going to be discussing today is summer projects. So some of the items contained within our presentation uh, for our second item are also listed as part of the ongoing projects for project status update. So this time I'll entertain any questions on project status. Miss McGraw. I just have a real quick one. I, I read what's here about uh, Benjamin started. What's left? What, what are the finishing things that need to be done? So there are um, some areas along the left-hand side of the building that need to have additional site work done okay. to get the parking lot extended. We had to get the portable classrooms moved out, which are all done now. The contractor has to get that section of the bus lot pushed all the way back almost to the tennis courts area. They've still got to do that. Um, and that's going to extend into the early part of the school year. We've been concentrating and focusing on getting them done with interior areas to turn over classroom spaces to the school. but. Please recall that we did have a significant delay with getting started with the permit, and so we've given the contractor a little additional time as a result of that, which is what's happening at the early part of this school year. So that's one thing. 
There's also an area um, on the rear of the building, which I believe are the music classrooms, that needs to be completely finished that will work into the early part of the fall finishing off. So there's no occupancy over on the new part? Oh, there will be occupancy oh, okay. on, on the areas this summer, yes, that we've been working on, yes. Oh, okay, that's what I was concerned about. Please also keep in mind that uh, once the project uh, got started through the design process, uh, we knew that there were enrollment growth issues, so we kept uh, one of the, we called, referred to as Wing E, we kept that section of the building. That part of the original scope, that was going to be part of some of the existing building that was going to be demolished. Uh, but uh, in you know, making sure that we had enough capacity at that school, uh, we kept that. So that's going to uh, allot for another five to six classrooms uh, for that school that was not part of the original scope. And that was a uh, you know, concern that uh, was actually expressed by some of the board members uh, as we were uh, through that design and process when we had the architect come in there. Uh, so we listened uh, and we evaluated and uh, we uh, made sure to keep that so we have room for additional growth. Also, the second elevator uh, work is uh, underway uh, and almost completed to get that operational. So you have an elevator that is, uh, which has have been used since the opening of the building uh, for students and staff to use to access the new three-story section of the building. There was also a second elevator. There was an issue with the design, uh, so that was not operational last year when that new three-story section of the building opened. But that new uh, elevator, second elevator, will be used primarily by building service and food and nutrition service staff. Keep in mind that we have the kind of a unique concept with the three separate eating areas, one on each uh, floor for the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So as food and nutrition service staff move uh, food and, and items around from the cafeteria to those three floors, they'll have access to that second elevator along with building service to move up ride-on scrubbers and you know equipment they use for cleaning uh, the building with that second elevator. And then again, that primary use uh, elevator for the first elevator will be just for students and staff for okay. movement between first and third floors as needed. Okay, thank you so much. Ms. Wilson. Um, can you talk about the barbering program, the construction, work, get TikTok, TikTok? Sure, so we do have a few slides, so if it would be okay uh, with the board, uh, we'd wait a few minutes uh, to show the actual slides, and we could go in more depth discussion with that, but work is underway uh, with that uh, project. Anyone else? Okay, I think we can go into the, uh, the PowerPoint. All right, so at this time I'll turn it over to Steve Andritz again, who's our Director of Planning and Construction, uh, to discuss the uh, projects that are highlighted. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, keep in mind, a lot of these photos are going to be from the very end of July, the beginning of August, so things may have even progressed a little further than what you see here. So we wanted to highlight a few of the projects. Uh, we're currently working at 16 of our 39 facilities this summer. And that's everything from... Say that again, please. We're currently working at 16 of our 39. This is considerably more. I've been with the school system for 15 years. We have never had this volume of work going on. We have more now than we have ever had. Uh, and that, that covers the gamut of work to be done, everything from full renovations to major HVAC projects to additions to small fit-out projects like the barbering program to moving relocatable classrooms. So we have a few of them to show you. We don't have them all, but we have a few. That's just within planning construction. Maintenance also has a, a number of smaller projects that they're working on as well. So that is not within the 16 that I mentioned. I think it's going to work. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so the first one we wanted to show you is Dr. Brown Elementary School. This was a project that we got funded through the state as a limited renovation. Uh, primarily, it's an open space project. It's called a limited renovation because we impacted at least five systems for the building, including replacing the roof. What you're looking at here is a photo of the media center. Um, you can see that the media center is completely enclosed. If you remember how Brown was laid out before you came in the front door, you had a corridor that ran uh, straight in front of you, and the media center was off to your left, surrounded by classrooms all the way around with uh, office-style partition walls. All of that is completely enclosed with drywall. They've got openings. Um, we've got a much better organized space. We've got breakout areas in this uh, media center area. We do have the use and occupancy for this building. We have the furniture and teacher um, information and, and materials have been brought over from the transition school uh, as we also move the transition, the, excuse me, the children from TC Martin and their stuff over to the transition school where they will be for the two years during the renovation. 
And I know this was a, a question during a prior board meeting. Uh, they did receive some new furniture. Keep in mind, this was a $6 million project, so this was not comparable to a complete renovation like we had at Eva Turner and Dr. Samuel Mudd, uh, which did have a larger budget, including for FF&E, uh, for furniture and equipment and, and technology. But uh, they did get a decent amount of, of new furniture, and we worked uh, with some other schools with projects going on to try to make sure we had the best furniture in place where new furniture was not uh, purchased. And, but you'll see some other uh, examples of new furniture in some of the other slides. So here we have a couple photos of some classrooms to show you. These are, as you see, completely enclosed. They've been updated to match our new layout with uh, tile floors throughout for the classrooms. Uh, this is an issue that we've updated over the last several years because of the amount of food that gets eaten uh, in classrooms, predominantly at the breakfast time. The picture on the left is actually the art room, which was one of the few enclosed classrooms. But when we went in to do the asbestos remediation that needed to be done in other areas of the building, we knew there were only a few other areas left. We went ahead and worked with our safety risk management department to get all of the abatement done, which meant a bunch of stuff had to be done in the art room to take out tile and take out some cabinetry. So we ended up spending a little money here, but we made this whole area feel new. So you've got the art classroom on your left, and then you've got a general classroom uh, on your right-hand side. I believe this is actually part of the maker space, which is adjacent to the media center, which is a new class they didn't really have. It's just a new organized space for them. This is this picture on the left is looking at the entryway into the media center from uh, cross quarter. You see it's nice and bright. It's nice and colorful. Uh, we've got some benches outside. We've got display cases. And then looking down the hall to your left, excuse me, the picture on your right, uh, you're standing with your back to the entryway, looking down the hall. The bulldog is still on the wall. We have the office area on the right, and then the nurses area is just behind that in that next area. But you can see we have nice, long, visible corridors. We have cross-connection corridors. So we've got significant improvements for circulation, visibility, supervision, all of that as part of this project. We're really, really happy with how this project has turned out. So this is obviously going to have a positive impact with instruction because, again, for those of you that are familiar with the previous facility, it was open space. So even including the media center was just an open space uh, area. So obviously that's going to cut down on the noise distractions with movement in the hallways uh, and improve you know, just even from classroom to classroom when you had the former open space with six foot high partitions where you could hear what was occurring in, in the neighboring classroom. And, and I think it really kind of limited the type of instruction you could deliver uh, in terms of you know, hands-on activities with students uh, when you have an open space environment. But, you know, and also to the right shows how you know, an event uh, of a situation where we either through a drill or a real life situation where we have to have that building and go into a lockdown because maybe an event happening in the community this gives students and staff a greater sense of security knowing that they have walls with a lockable door, whereas in the past they did not have that. So we're able to address two important key aspects of things that you know we want to do with, with education is provide the facility to provide a quality education, but also provide a safe environment where students and staff feel, feel safe. Two other things to add, um, you're not gonna see in the slides, but there are two, mul two sets of multi-user restrooms in this area that got completely renovated as well. So those got improved, not just classroom spaces. And then the second thing I wanna mention is that if you think about the way Dr. Brown has laid out, everything from the front door to the left was the open space classrooms. To the right was the admin area, and then beyond that, the gym. We worked with maintenance who went in and also um, did a bunch of work in the gym. We put some additional, um, do we have that in there? I'm sorry. Ah, okay, sorry. I'm speaking a little too ahead of myself. So there was a bunch of extra work that was done by maintenance to add to this project so that we made a full uh, uplift feeling to the school with what the, what the project achieves. So they did new flooring. They went in and put in additional lights and put in LED lights in those areas. They painted. It's much, much brighter, more welcoming space, more of what you'd expect to see uh, for an elementary school, especially with today's standards if we were building a new building. And this is something I greatly appreciate uh, with Steve Andritz and then Steve Vance, who's our director, or our supervisor of maintenance, is the collaboration between those two offices. So whether it be a limited project like this or even a, a major project where we have to make some cuts either through design, through value engineering, or uh, just things were not part of the original scope of work that we would like to include, but we know not to include it because it's going to drive the cost of construction up. But those two gentlemen and their offices work very closely together. So 
These are things, again, not part of the original scope, but in working right from the get-go with Steve Vance, you know, he can do some budgeting things and then also appreciate uh, Karen Acton, our, our Chief of Fiscal Services, because we also occasionally get money for uh, some fund balance money. So, you know, we've done this in the past with some major projects with, with Eva Turner, the parking lot, the, the site work was not, it had to be cut out as with VE. So. Uh, we were able to add on things with those projects. So even while a project is in the midst of it, uh, there's always collaboration going on between the teams and, and we'll walk the building and we're like, well, we, maybe we need to add this and if the funding's there, we'll, we, we'll, we will do that. So numerous things added to this project were not part of the scope and also including, uh, which we didn't show any pictures of, uh, some work with the kitchen uh, to improve the circulation and, and functionality of, of the kitchen. So, you know, it's something that Bill Cruder uh, brought to our attention and. Since it was brought to our attention early on, we were able to address that and add that to the scope. So we are very excited with what, and I'm not saying we'll be able to do this again with $6 million because <laughs> when this, things have changed since this got started with rising construction costs, but I mean, if, 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 knowing what that facility looked like before and knowing what it looks like now, and we did it for around $6 million. I mean, there's kudos to everyone involved in that project. I am super excited uh, about that project. And it was exciting when, you know, to be there a couple times when staff would come over uh, from Brown and see the progress and see the, 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 the final project. It just, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes you wonder, well, you know, am I going to go back the next day? But it's things like that that, uh, you know, are super rewarding for the work that we do. And again, just super excited how this turned out. Yeah, one other thing to add is that this actually school was highlighted by the IEC the Interagency Commission on School Construction in their quarterly uh, report, their quarterly newsletter, uh, which was pretty exciting to see that that happened. And so far, this is the second school that they've highlighted of ours, um, Dr. Mudd being the first one about two years ago. So we're excited and um, looking forward to future opportunities. Uh, the next school is J.P. Ryan. J.P. Ryan is a full-day kindergarten addition. This project is actually funded through the Maryland Stadium Authority grant, which is the Built to Learn money uh, and local CIP funds. This is early stages where the site work was being done, uh, clearing off the side of the building. So if you think about J.P. Ryan, it actually is to the left and to the rear of the building where the addition is going to go on. Uh, not completely around the back where the playground is and not completely to the left, but in that general area. So the contractor here is doing uh, grading, starting to clear the site, get the trees out. Um, we did have one real large tree right up beside the road that was being kept. That's what you see over here on the uh, left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side picture, this is where they've actually brought the building pad. They're bringing the building pad on to grade so that they can then start digging the footings for the addition itself. This project is about a year-long um, project, and we'd be looking to have this completed for next summer to be able to move into this. I believe this is a five classroom addition for this school. And this is one of six kindergarten additions we have left to complete. And with the blueprint and the movement towards full day pre-K, projects like this become even more and more important for uh, the school system. So it may not necessarily be that we're going to have pre-K classrooms in there, but as we can move kindergarten classrooms from their existing areas into the new parts of the pre uh, to this kindergarten addition, that frees up some space for us uh, for having additional pre-K students because uh, we are going to have some growing pains with the movement towards full day pre-K because uh, if you keep in mind uh, with half day you had two classes utilizing one classroom space so uh, you know, we can all do the math on that so it's going to put some some space issues on our 22 elementary school so these remaining six projects are going to become very vital to, for us to get completed uh, to provide that additional space that is needed. And if you look at the picture on the left, you'll actually recognize that the farm fields that used to be across the street from the school are now popping up as houses. So all of the area around J.P. Ryan and John Hansen has been significantly being developed over the last five years, and it just continues. So we definitely have growth in that area adjacent. Next is Malcolm Elementary School. This is another one of the full-day kindergarten additions. This is also funded through Maryland Stadium Authority through the Built to Learn funds. Uh, this actually is the site contractor tearing out the tennis courts, which were on the left-hand side of the building. Uh, you'll see Poplar Hill Road uh, in the upper, uh, upper left area. If you look at the little bit of asphalt you can see up there, uh, there is a activity area and I believe four classrooms going in. There's additionally some modifications that have to happen to the two existing classrooms on that end of the building to create the corridor way through. 
So there was some renovation happening to those classrooms as well as part of this project. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight, as Mr. Heim mentioned, because these projects were as far along as they are, both Malcolm and Ryan, we were not able to add a pre-K classroom to them. However, with the other ones that are still ongoing, are still in the design process, still waiting for planning approvals from the state, we have said that they are going to have to include at least one more classroom for a pre-K because of the full day pre-K mandate. So we're trying to make that shift as we can. We were too far along here to make that adjustment, but on these other ones, we will make that adjustment. And another, uh, you know, to elaborate on the, the point of collaboration between planning, construction, and maintenance. So one of the things with the new addition, we had to sprinkle, have a sprinkling system for that new addition based upon when Malcolm originally built the codes that didn't require that entire building to be have a sprinkler system. So maintenance and collaboration with planning construction, one of the add-ons to this project, not being funded out through, this, uh, through the Built to Learn, but through uh, various maintenance funds through the maintenance office, uh, we're gonna be sprinkling that entire building. Uh, and this, going back to J.P. Ryan uh, doing some work with the replacing, the, you know, because they have to tie in the new section of the building to the, the uh, current uh, fire panel and fire alarm system, doing some reworking of the entire uh, fire panel and fire system at, at Ryan as well. Um, to add on to what Mr. Heim was mentioning, as I showed you this first slide, the addition is going on the left-hand side of the school. If you look at the shot uh, on the left-hand side, we're actually on the back right side of the building. Malcolm is on a, a rural school that's on well, uh, well and septic, and the building that you see there with the uh, four-sided roof is actually the well pump house. We're putting in additional uh, supports in that vicinity to create the sprinkler system. So we've got to create additional tanks, put that in, um, we decided to work that through to cover the whole building. Right now, the building only had, I believe, four sprinkler heads, which were in just a few uh, mechanical closets in the building. They did not have coverage of the whole building. Um, so we're, we're very fortunate that we're able to work through with maintenance to get this done because it will benefit everyone once it's done. The shot on the uh, right-hand side is the actual graded pad, and uh, the contractor is working on the footings. These are two shots of the classroom inside that was being re that are being renovated, where the corridor goes through the middle. Um, they actually tore out the ceilings. They had to create the wall, which is what you see on the right hand side. Um, but we're putting in new carpet. We're putting in new ceiling. We're painting so that they'll get a nice little facelift. And those, the contractor did not have to finish those until next summer, but the contractor jumped in right away to get this done, to have it ready so that the teachers, when they come back to start this school year, could have both of those rooms refreshed and ready to go. Uh, this is a local contractor who has done an excellent job. It's Dennis Anderson Construction. So we're really excited about how this project is going and excited about all the opportunities that it will present as we move forward. Next, we have La Plata High School. Um, this, this one I'm gonna call a found project uh, because this was not on our, I know that's just a little strange terminology, but. This one was not on our radar. Yeah, it was not on our radar with our current <coughs> CIP. It was not in our five-year plan last year. It was not in our five-year plan this year. But when the federal ESSER, excuse me, yeah, yeah, federal ESSER funds, the COVID relief funds came out, they had provisions in there that let you apply for HVAC projects. And so we had actually thrown into the ESSER two um, list of projects air conditioning replacement at this school because it's one that has a lot of nuances, it's got a lot of issues. Maintenance has two personnel who basically spend every day during the school year at that building servicing the system that's there. So when it got approved, we were thrilled. And then we started through the design process and found out how much more it was gonna cost us. And then we had a lot of coordination that we had to do with uh, Karen Acton and, and folks to get the funds there, but ultimately got it approved. So the contractor has been working diligently this summer to go in and install infrastructure in the building. So they have gone into just about every space in the building, torn out ceilings, put in new diffusers, put in the VRF cassette units. Now the VRF cassette units will not be functional this school year. We've advised the school about that to make sure that they're communicating that out to the staff and to the teachers and to the students. Um, but we also went ahead and had all the ductwork completely cleaned we have, the, as mentioned, the new diffuser. So if you look at this, you'll actually see uh, new flex line and new diffuser in this shot. And then the square that you actually see off in the distance is the new um, VRF unit. So the old system will remain functional for fresh air with new equipment that gets replaced next summer, the large units. 
and then the VRFs will be all powered up next summer after we get the new switch gear put in. So, so the diffusers supply the fresh air for that's correct. the classroom in those areas. Right. And then you also have return right. air to take out uh, the existing right. air. So you have that, uh, we talked about that air change rates occurring within enclosed spaces and even open spaces of the building. And the VRFs will provide the heat and air for the system. Um, the contractor had to go in and rip out the ceilings all the way in the quarters on the second floor. So we have all new ceilings already installed. They've been working, putting everything back together. Um, so you can see actually on the left hand side, this is new ceiling that was going in. Uh, we ended up putting in some new sprinkler heads because of some issues about discussion rings and how to get them in with the tiles. Um, you can see that's an area, this is coming up the stair off of the uh, gym cafeteria area and commons area up to the top looking down the hall towards uh, the admin area on the second floor. So, and we appreciate Mr. Dole and the principal there and his staff working with this. Obviously, this is disruptive work, even for the summertime when you have less programs occurring. So, you know, that's one of the things with, with Steve and, and, and other folks has there been a lot of collaboration uh, between the La Plata administration and, and our offices to let them know, you know, what's happening in terms of schedules, uh, knowing what, you know, areas they still need to use and uh, making sure that, you know, we can get this building back into a situation where we have minimal disruptions during the course of the school day. But, you know, imagine we're pretty much replacing everything with the HVAC with this in a building that is occupied. So it's not an easy thing to do because we need to have cooling, you know, still in parts of the building during the summertime because there's staff there. Obviously, we can't have cooling not working in the fall or in the spring when it's, you know, where we still have hot temperatures. And obviously we have to make sure that in the winter time we can still heat, heat the building. So this is an ambitious project, but that money was out there and we did not want to pass up this opportunity to do something. And if we didn't have this funding source, we would not be, not be doing it. So it was something we could not pass up to improve, you know, make it a more efficient system, improve the air quality uh, for this building. But it is going to be disruptive at, at times. And so there is that coordination occurring between uh, my offices and the school uh, to you know, let everyone know what the schedules are and to try to minimize those, those disruptions. But this will be an ongoing project. The contractor is actually transitioning to evening shift as of the 22nd. So they'll be working um, three to one, four days a week through the school year, concentrating in certain areas, making additional connections and working through the process to prep for next summer's work, which will be another significant lift because we'll actually have no air conditioning in the building all next summer in order to get the major units replaced. So the other shot on the right hand side is actually a completed classroom already installed ceilings back in uh, turnover to building service completely clean done. Uh, if you look at the upper right of that picture, that is the VRF cassette unit that you see that that uh, rectangular circular shape um, as well as a new diffuser in the space. Some more here, obviously you got some pictures from on the roof on the left and on the right. They have to put in new curbs, they have to put in pipe legs to support the new equipment that's coming next summer. But important to get all of that stuff in now so it's ready for next summer's work. This uh, middle shot is down through the corridor with some of the piping runs that had to be done and some additional duct work that had to be done in order to support these, these projects. And we do have in our five-year CIP a limited renovation for La Plata. So that was taken into consideration in working with the engineers who designed this system, knowing that we potentially have some other work in the, in the pipeline down, down the road. So we're trying to think ahead uh, for that project. And what we've done is we've paired the design teams for this HVAC work where the MEP is the lead on this job and then with the design that Mr. Heim was just mentioning, the architect is the lead and that MEP is supporting them. It's just a flip-flop of the organization with the first project. Then McDonough High School. Uh, this is actually some shots of the turf field. Uh, we're actually actively working over there. Unfortunately, we've had some rain events that have put us behind schedule. We've also had some unsuitable soil materials. Uh, we actually have a photo, uh, not in here for you, but a photo of a fairly significant log that was dug out from under the ground in the middle of the field that was completely burned. So our best guess is that when they cleared the field, they burned everything, and then what was left, they buried. So we had a significant area that we've had to undercut, which takes time, and so we're actively working on that. Uh, we're pushing to get that done as soon as possible, but it has been a little bit of a slow process. So you've probably heard us talking 
past with some of the new construction projects when we look at site work. We have to get to com certain compaction rates with where there's going to be parking, where there's going to be a building pad. So even the same thing with this uh, artificial surface that's going to be, they had to get to compaction rates. So they had to remove a decent amount of, of soil that was not suitable uh, in order to proceed with the, with the project. We have some photos here of the drainage system. So just inside the track, if you look at the photo on the right-hand side, you see the track is the uh, dark black asphalt surface. There's a concrete curb that's poured to hold the track in place so it doesn't crumble while you're working. But there's a trench that's dug through there with the pipe that you see on the left-hand side going in and then filled with stone. And the fabric goes on the field. So anything that falls on the surface makes its way into there and then drains out through the system. And, just, and we did consider other options before the final decision was made to go with the artificial surface. We had uh, several different uh, options, uh, estimates from, uh, one of the, you know, from two contractors who were potentially going to be doing, doing the work. So we did look at replacing it again with a, a natural surface. When we compared the cost of doing all the things to improve the drainage, put the new natural surface down, then factoring that you obviously would have to have, that, uh, have the, you know, a watering system for that, uh, and looking at the long-term maintenance of it, we you know, weighed those costs and we went with the filled uh, surface. Keep in mind that McDonough is on a well, so that's one of the things we considered is we didn't want to be continuing to water that field and putting the strain on that, that well for, that supplies the, the, the water for that, that school. So we believed and we still believe that this was the best option, but it's been, uh, there's, we've had some obstacles along the way. And, but there again, there's been coordination between the administration at McDonough and also the athletic director there, Ms. Thornton, uh, and, and Steve and his folks on trying to keep them abreast of, of the timeline and also with some of the delays. So there, you know, we anticipate ha it's going to have some impacts on the early part of the September schedule for athletics, but that's something that's been conveyed to the, to the school. Next, we actually have the second project, which is at McDonough High School. This is the limited renovation project. This is built to learn funded through MSA. Um, what you actually see here in this photo is the front of the school, the, uh, across the front bus parking lot, we had to trench through there to put in a sewer line that will come from the new addition that's going to be on the front left side of the building. So this is how everything is going to flow into the system. This goes down. Uh, as you see in the far distance, it makes a hard left turn and goes down the hill towards the entry into the locker rooms area and ties into the, the uh, sewer lift station that's down there by a new manhole. This, um, keep in mind also McDonough is not only on a well, but it's on a shared sewer system with CSM. So we had to make sure everything is done right, tied into our system, that it all goes over. We don't want anything where we could be getting extra materials or inflow in that we don't want into that system. We want to be good stewards along with CSM as part of that project. Uh, and this actually has been paved as of Monday. So you see the building pad here. This is, as I mentioned, the, uh, and you look at the left-hand slide, you see the right hand of that, you see the building. That's the edge of the auditorium area. Uh, they're prepping the building pad. In the middle slide, you see what's left of the, sort of that loop around the front entrance, the, the old front office entrance and the flagpole on the right-hand side. All of that is um, being addressed. That will change significantly when the project is finished, but there will be a different access pattern for the school throughout this school year. So we've been working to coordinate that, and there have been several meetings and discussions with the principal about how they're going to um, bring the students in and out and what access points are going to be, and they've actually decided to change part of their uh, student drop-off, parent drop-off uh, for the early morning drop-offs as a result of that. Then the Steedham Barbering Program. Uh, this is looking from, so the Steedham Bartering Program is in Building D, which is uh, in the middle in the back. So if you recall, there's five buildings at Steedham. Building B is the front building, the front office area building. So it's the building directly behind that is Building D. This is in the back left corner of that area, um, which was functioning as a multi-purpose and media center area. But what you see here is that large area where we actually have workstations. Uh, as of this morning, the workstations are framed out waiting for the countertop, which is supposed to come on Wednesday or Thursday this week. They have just to the right. Uh, so the ceilings are actually installed as well. That's changed since this slide. In the slide on the left-hand side, the uh, openings that you see in the middle of the floor there are for shampoo wash stations. So this will have all of the same functions that you would expect from 
uh, a similar program that we already have with cosmetology, just with barbering. So we have wash stations, we have a waiting area, we have a restroom at the front of the building, we have the workstations. We also have a very large area in the middle, which is for teaching space, whether they set up with desks or not is uh, yet to be determined by the, the teacher that will be there. Um, we also have cabinetry. We have, if you look at the right-hand picture, you can kind of see on the left-hand side, there's a clean room and storage area behind the wall there. Uh, at the far end of that area, there's the teacher's office. So all of those things have been planned out and laid out and the contractor is calling for his inspections for electrical and other things on Thursday to prep for the teacher coming in uh, starting Monday because it's a new program. So one thing I do want to mention here is we know that the HVAC unit that has to supply this will not be here in time. That's a known fact. It's something we've known that it's not coming until October. Hmm. So what we have is we have a really large temporary spot cooler that's in the rear of the room. It has been there and it will remain there until the new one is, is brought in and can be connected, uh, but we are assured that that will not be an issue for us as far as being able to occupy the space. And as Steve mentioned, we have a number of other projects that are going on uh, between either his office or Steve Vance's office with, with maintenance. So I'm not going to go over all of them, but I will just highlight a few things. Uh, the second bullet, Gail Bailey exterior door replacement. Uh, we had a little bit of money left over in that security money that we got from the county a few years back, which majority of that money was used for creating the guided vestibules, uh, and, uh, make sure that each school had a guided vestibule. Uh, we're replacing the exterior doors, uh, which that has actually happened already at Gail Bailey, and we're waiting on the interior doors to come in, uh, replacing the interior doors of, for the classrooms there, and also new locking mechanisms, which are now ADA compatible. They had the old round doorknobs, uh, which is no longer compliant for, for code. Uh, we've talked about, uh, and we didn't show any pictures because it's just, you know, the demo is beginning. Uh, Bateman is done at T.C. Martin, but uh, T.C. Martin had a move occurred over the summertime, so uh, all the staff's resources, materials, teaching materials were relocated from T.C. Martin to the transition school because Brown moved out this summer. So for the next two years, we're going to have the renovation occurring at T.C. Martin. That's a $40 million renovation, uh, and we're, again, excited about that project. But again, just to show how much work is going on in this, uh, in this county with, with the school system to bring facilities up to modern standards, but also we're adding capacity to that school. So it's not only important to improve the building, to bring it up to modern standards, but also to add capacity for the growth that we know is happening around the county. Uh, we, we talked about the Benjamin Starter Middle School finishing up uh, later this fall. Another project we're excited about that we finally got funding for, which work began, it's going to be a phased uh, project, is the John Hansen Middle School roof replacement. So that will occur uh, this summer through, through next summer. And we got funding through that. It had been on our CIP for several years. We didn't get approval for construction funding from the state. So we applied for the Healthy Schools Facilities Fund, and we got that project approved. So again, excited about that, addressing you know, part of the infrastructure to, to an aging facility. Uh, some work going on with some, uh, not a total replacement of the HVAC system at, at Henson, uh, but making some upgrades to that. Doing a replacement of the gym floor at Smallwood, that is finishing up, and then also a beach replacement. With that, there was abatement work that had to happen, and with the abatement work, uh, there had to be some grinding down uh, to the concrete, and they ended up having to add to the scope of that work to flatten out the, the current concrete before they could put down the new floor, uh, wooden floor surface, because Obviously, if it was not flat, we didn't want to have issues arise uh, down, down the road with that. Uh, pretty much a total replacement of the Lackey tennis courts. Uh, I think that probably was mentioned during a board meeting that uh, Lackey did not uh, practice or hold their uh, matches last spring on the court because we had some large cracks that had developed with, due to some drainage issues. Plus, just also with the resurface with the asphalt being uh, added on top. So pretty much a complete uh, replacement of that uh, Tennis court is underway now and will be done for the start of the tennis season in the, in the spring. Uh, Steve mentioned that uh, McDonough uh, is on a septic and, and, and a, uh, a well system. We feed our wastewater from not only McDonough, uh, but also Craig and Steatham to CSM. Uh, so we've discovered uh, some issues with the, uh, with the manhole and, and, and that system that uh, goes from those three schools down to CSM. So we are working on that to make sure that we don't have infiltration from groundwater into that. So we're feeding groundwater into that, that system. So there's some repairs that are ongoing with that. And then lastly, uh, Steve mentioned, we moved the 10 relocatable classrooms from Stoddard. Six of them went to Pickawaxen. 
because of pickle wax and we're going to receive additional students with middle school redistricting. Two of them went to Middleton. Middleton has growth. And then two of them went to Henson. Uh, referring back to the T.C. Martin, T.C. Martin had six relocatable classrooms. So this fall, they're going to be moved uh, from T.C. Martin to John Hansen because John Hansen has, has growth there. So 16 relocatable classrooms will be moved either through this summer or, or the fall. So a lot of things happening uh, between planning, construction, maintenance, and, and operations. So I appreciate all the hard work and long hours that they put in uh, this summer, and they'll be you know, numerous long hours between now and the start of the school year. So again, I, I uh, always like to highlight everything that they are doing. A lot of great people who quietly go about behind the scenes uh, making our facilities the best that they, they can be. So I thank everyone involved in those, those projects. That's it. Thank you both very much. Uh, you know, it's, you listen to this and, and yeah, I use the light switch analogy, right? You, you flick a switch and the light comes on, but there, there's so much that happens in the back end <laughs> that people don't realize and so much that happens after that light switch to, to make things happen. And uh, to echo your words, I, I appreciate everyone's hard work and um, to realize that that many schools are being worked on uh, in the summertime. Uh, folks are, are, are doing a great job, so I appreciate it. Uh, is there any comments or questions from board members? Ms. Wilson? With regard to McDonough, maybe not limited to McDonough, but I'll pick McDonough being on a private well and septic system, and you indicated the, the connection to the College of Southern Maryland. With the growth of the town of La Plata, I know that I've heard discussions about capacity of the septic system, of the waste treatment with the town of La Plata, and I know that there has been some discussions about the College of Southern Maryland upgrades etc I'm assuming that you guys have, are having discussions um, whether the College of Southern Maryland septic system continues etc um, and I would also add about connecting to water because there's a number of uh, residential projects that are getting closer and closer to La Plata whether or not we are having some sort of uh, discussion and I just want to also add about McDonough High School um, the case program I know would like to have a greenhouse and at some point with all this construction that's going around that somehow we make sure that that is um, incorporated I have a couple other points but well, okay, if I could just add to the greenhouse if that's okay uh, Kevin Reisinger who works in CT upstairs in the instruction office has secured grant money uh, for greenhouse so we've been we've had a number of meetings with him uh, so they've actually are in the process of securing a structure uh, to be placed on the campus uh, of McDonough to address that. And, and also Ms. Bryant, the instructor, has been involved in that process as well. Yes. So I think we have something that is suitable uh, for, for their needs. Yes. So I, I just know with the growth, uh, and that's great to hear it, but I was just wondering with the growth potential in the immediate area, particularly with McDonough, and I don't know if there's any other, what are the remaining schools that are on public, private uh, systems that somehow at some point we're reaching a point where we could connect. Um, and then uh, asbestos, whenever you bring up asbestos, it uh, just makes me wonder what else is left out there. And I, I was wondering if there's any discussion about expansion or updating the Starkey building. So I'll try to address all those things, all right? Uh, I'll try to help. The asbestos, so we are required uh, through the state to keep any building that has a asbestos, we have to keep books on that. So uh, when the state comes down, we're able to identify where those areas are. There's something that has to be accessible to the building service staff so they know that. Uh, and as long as the asbestos is encapsulated, it's enclosed, it's not exposed because we had buildings, you know, any building was built prior to the, you know, the 1980s, you're likely going to have asbestos in mastic through flooring, it was used for glue, for, for towel, for carpet, uh, it was used for, for, uh, for wrapping with, with pipes, it was used for fireproofing, even behind chalkboards, uh, it was used as, a, again, for a mastic. So we know those areas because uh, we, we have to keep that book. And you know, to Steve's point, when we talked about some of these projects with abatement that's going on, uh, 
you know, and it's valuable for to have those books because when we do renovation where we're going to be exposing those areas, we actually have to have a licensed company come in and do the uh, abatement. And it's costly. So, you know, with, with, with mud, I believe it was $400,000 to do all the abatement and that, which had to be, had to be done before we started complete demolition of, of, of that building. And I mentioned with the, just even with a small project like the, the floor at, at uh, Smallwood, we had to do abatement for that, uh, during that process of removing the, the towels and then before the new floor could be down. So that's something that we're required to the state uh, to monitor. We have to do inspection. So Glenn Belmore, who's our safety and risk manager, uh, is involved in those inspections that occur and also make upkeeping those books and he has staff that, that helps him with that. Uh, to the to water anytime we have an opportunity to tie into public water and sewage we'll do it uh to my memory the most recent examples was when we did matthew henson uh and, uh, and, and, and jc parks, parks yep. uh several years back so several years back they were on their own water uh and, and systems uh, system when we had the opportunity to tie into the county system we did that uh some of these areas we you know right. i don't see it in the foreseeable future so with tc martin that renovation there is nothing you know that in anywhere near that proximity to tie into that. So through that, uh, you know, we'll be addressing uh, with adding the additional capacity to make sure that the well that is there to provides enough water for the number of staff and students there. And there's also work gonna be done on that treatment plant, again, uh, to bring it up to be able to handle the additional capacity there. You know, with, with McDonough, Craig, and, and Stephen, we think that those are schools that aren't too far off. So if we had the ability to tie into uh, the, the county, we would, we would definitely take advantage of that. Uh, or, the or, the, or the town. Or the, or the town. Yeah, any of those, we would definitely take advantage of those, those opportunities if, if they exist. Uh, and just a little bit more without getting too much into the business of CSM, but uh, our discussions with them began several years ago because they know that even beyond just expansion uh, around the, the, the campus or whether it be residential, that their system needed to be up to be replaced. It was come to the point where you know there's concern of you know failure of it down down the road. So that was something, and we appreciate obviously since we're involved in uh, our wastewater going there from those three schools. We're very uh, appreciative of the fact that we've been involved in those discussions, and there's a plan for CSM to go ahead and address that and replace that that current system. Uh, so I got a bestest, I got water, was there something, and we talked to Greenhouse. Can I add one thing? Sure. About like T.C. Martin, for example, a new well was put in because they had water issues about two years ago. Mm -hmm. But with the addition, excuse me, with the expansion renovation project, we're going to put in a second well, so we'll have duplicate for redundancy. But we're also going to be completely redoing, replacing the septic system. So there will be a brand new septic system for that school that will handle everything from the new building. So we're not relying on an old system as part of that. Uh, but we do have a number of schools like Malcolm and Mount Hope and Lack. I mean, Lackey's connected to Sewer, but we have other ones like Pico and Higdon that are far out from where development is going to occur that are not likely to have those opportunities to get hooked up to public water or sewer. But when they do present, we, we look at how we can make that happen. And last, last question, and I know you may not be able to answer, but normally we get a report about water testing, drinking, you know, you test. Sure, so that's that's... Under uh, House Bill, I think it was 270 off the top of my head, but the lead water testing. So we completed our latest round this past school year. So all of our schools, uh, and keep in mind, we go an extra step. Through that uh, House Bill, we're not required to, you know, and to tie into those uh, schools that are on probably private wells. We're not required by that law to do testing for lead for them. But we know that since we were going to be posting those reports for any school that's on public water and sewage, it's going to lead some questions from from students or staff or or parents who have kids who attend those uh, schools on private wells. So we do testing of all of it, and including this building. We're not required by by that uh, house bill to do testing in Starkey and in the other administrative offices, but we test all of them. So uh, to get to my point, uh, every three years, those schools that are on pub or public wells ha or not public wells, but public water systems have to be tested. We completed that uh, latest round last spring. Moving up well, for this year, we're going to do them one third, so we're not doing testing for everything all in one year period. So since it has to be done once every three years, we're going to do it in thirds. So one third will be tested this this school year, one third next year, and then uh, one third the following year. And as that's that's completed, then we update uh, those lab results. So you would not anticipate and see in any lab results. We're going to start the next round of testing in the late 
fall, early winter. So, and it usually takes a month to two months for us to get those results. So the earliest you start seeing results for this next round of testing will be uh, early in 2023. But all of our pre previous tests, which are in compliance with being having con been conducted in the last three years, are posted on the school system website. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? All right, gentlemen. We have one more item, uh, which is the CIP, which is a very important uh, report item because this is something we have to get board approval uh, down the line. We get county approval, and then ultimately, fingers crossed, we get state approval for the amount of money that we are requesting. So I will turn it back over to Mr. Andrews. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll attempt to be brief on this. There's a whole packet. It's on board docs. We're not going to go through it. I'm going to highlight a couple things. Um, as was mentioned by Mr. Heim, this is a report item. We will come back in September with the action item for approval because this is due to the state October the 4th, and then our local CIP is due to the county shortly thereafter, usually around the 15th. Um, the CIP follows much of what was already laid out in the Educational Facilities Master Plan, as well as where we left off with last year's CIP. Uh, and a good example to that is we got funding, our first year of funding for T.C. Martin last year and a first year of funding for Elementary 23 last year. We will be asking for second years of funding on both of those projects to start our CIP process. All that's laid out in here and we'll talk about that. Uh, another thing that's significant is, as Mr. High mentioned, we do have increasing cost with construction. Uh, the state recognized that and they have increased the cost per square foot by 7.5%. We do think that's a little low compared to what we've seen and what others have seen around the state, but that is the, that is the average that they looked at from all across the state and came up with. However, they are saying that if we experience considerable uh, cost overages with bids on projects across the state, they will look at this and reevaluate even if it means they have to raise that number mid-year. So 7.5% was what's, what was just approved, uh, which is moving forward. Then you have a list of projects broken out. Um, by year of what we're going to be asking for on the next two sheets as well as some local projects. Uh, you have our project schedule uh, showing you when they're going to be done in uh, bar format and you have the uh, step charts uh, elementary middle school and high school which project our current capacities of the schools as well as anytime we're adding new capacity and what our enrollment is for the last year what it's projected to be for this year and then what it's projected to be for upcoming uh, 10 years. So those three are in here. And then we have the description of the projects that are out there. Um, they start and they're addressed by projects that add new capacity. So kindergarten additions are first, then new schools and additions. And then you get into the project descriptions of the systemic type projects. So uh, with that, I'll just leave it at that unless there are any questions. Board members? I have a quick question. Yeah. In looking at this <laughs> list, I don't see Gail Bailey on the list anymore for being renovated. Uh, Gail Bailey is likely a ways off because of the significant improvements that have been made. If you think about the last 10 years, they've had a site improvement, parking lot, lighting improvement. They had a roof. They had the HVAC replaced. They've had a kindergarten addition. They had a security vestibule. We had to do work to improve their veneer because they had some water intrusion. We got that squared away. They have recently had wood doors, and ex wood doors are going on now, correct? Yes. Exterior doors were recently replaced. The gym has been refurbished. So when you look at all the things that have already been done through various sources, whether they be state and local CIP or just year-end funded or maintenance funds, um, and the fact that there is not the growth pressures that we have at a lot of, a lot of other places, it is probably a ways off to the time when Gail Bailey gets fully renovated. Twenty thirties. Probably a ways off. Yes. <laughs> okay. Just checking. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Next, Mr. Schwartz. Good afternoon. I am presenting 
uh, as a report item, policy 8160, the board's ethics policy. This has been presented as a report item previously. I'm bringing it back as a second time report item because the State Ethics Commission has suggested making several changes to it. As you may know, the State Ethics Commission has to approve our board's ethics policy. It's the only policy we have that has to be approved by some other agency. And so when we sent the draft of the report item from last meeting, they made some suggestions. Those suggestions are reflected on board docs uh, in all caps bold italicized language. So that's the difference between <laughs> the all caps bold language that we are suggesting to make amendments to our current policy. So that's on board docs. Uh, it's a report item today. It will come back as an action item at the next board meeting. Are there any questions? I can address those. Anything from board members? It looks fairly straightforward. Anything of concern on your no, end, Mr. Schwartz? Next item. The next item is uh, an amendment to the uh, public charter school agreement between the Board of Education and the Phoenix International School of the Arts, PESOTA. As you may know, the board had approved the charter application for PESOTA last school year and adopted a charter agreement with PESOTA. That agreement is being amended uh, because PESOTA has uh, decided that they needed to move to a different facility than initially proposed. The facility they're proposing is in La Plata. Um, because of the change in the facility, we have to amend the charter. Uh, we've met with uh, PESOTA and their representative, Ms. Jackson, who is here today. Ms. Jackson for attending. Uh, we've met with her and her team several times to discuss the proposed facility. And uh, based on um, our agreement to allow her to move the facility, the recommendation from the superintendent is for the board to amend the charter. Because of the facility change, there are several changes that will be required in the charter, including some of the updates to so the dates of construction that we're requiring her to meet. Uh, there are changes to the, uh, the plans for food service because the charter facility will not have a full kitchen, and uh, the superintendent staff has agreed to those changes as well. Uh, we've made a couple other minor uh, changes. For example, we changed vice principal to assistant principal just to update some of the language. And the other change we've uh, agreed to make in our recommendation to the board is for the school to open as a 6th, 7th, 8th grade in the first year. So it'll be a full middle school with 150 students in the first year. Uh, the changes are reflected on the document on board docs. Uh, again, the entire contract is there. The changes are highlighted in red throughout the agreement. And we are seeking a uh, recommendation the, the, of the superintendent is seeking a uh, uh, approval of the board for those charter changes. Uh, this is a report item right now. If uh, you have any questions, we can address it. And then we'll come back as an action item at the end of the board meeting today. Any questions from any board members? Okay, so Thank we'll, we'll I, vote on this I will, uh, we'll bring it back as an action item at the end of the board meeting. I, again, want to thank Ms. Jackson for attending and for all the work that she's put in. We're excited that this school will open up in the 2023-24 school year. So, again, thank you, Ms. Jackson. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, recurring resolutions. Um, there is an attachment or, or there's a, a something on board docs for each of these and they are broken out by month So, Mr. Schwartz, on resolutions, are we looking now to approve these, or is this a uh, just a report item? Sure. 
You should read your sticks. You should read your sticks. Okay. And this is also an opportunity um, if, um, if there's any other um, resolutions that a board member would like to bring up for the board to consider. Dr. Navarro, anything you'd like to add? No, I just wanted to make sure that we, last year, um, the board added the um, school media or the library, and I just, I may be missing it in this list. Yeah, that was working Next to that. student Next And I think that that one is missing, so that's an error on our part. I think that's one that the board added last year. Yes. It's under the month of the child. Oh, it is. It is. Which month oh, is it in? Sorry. Under the month of the child. Okay. Good. Under where? Oh, the National Library Week, Week Resolution. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. I hadn't seen it. That was the only one. Okay. So any questions? Then as Mr. Schwartz indicated, we will uh, take these as an action item at a future date. Okay, uh, next is unfinished business. Ms. McGraw. Well, since the work session, I received a lot of feedback from various members of the community, whether it be through email, telephone calls, or face-to-face -face interaction regarding the eligibility policy. And since we did not vote on the staff recommendation, Mr. Hancock did make that recommendation in the form of a motion, but it never got seconded. Um, I would like to reintroduce that. I've done some soul searching regarding um, the elements of the policy that the staff recommended to us, and I would like to propose that we accept the staff recommendation for the eligibility policy, being that, um, the, uh, in case anybody doesn't remember, <laughs> students must have a 2.0 grade point average um, that uh, no, they will not have any Fs and that the absences are, are fewer than five days from the previous quarter and students who are absent five or more days may provide documentation for a lawful absence and that the incoming uh, ninth graders will not be subject to the eligibility rule until the end of the first semester. So I'd like to make that motion. A second. So that is a motion by Ms. McGraw and seconded by Ms. Brown. Is there any discussion? Mr. Hancock. Certainly support this. Um, are we going to have to change some language on that on the absences? as it's written um like minimal i'm sorry didn't mean to cut you off no, no, uh, but I, I think yeah, i'm talking about I, I think we're good on the language cool thank yep. you okay any other discussion okay and as Ms. McGraw indicated, you know, this is something that, that a lot of folks have, have spoken about. And, and even if the board chooses to, um, to accept this, we, we will still, if you look at what other counties do, have, uh, we'll have the most stringent eligibility policy uh, in, in the state uh, because of other things that, that, um, um, that we require. So um, I certainly don't look at this as a, as a lowering of a standard, but rather as an opportunity um, for students and um, and as was presented it it's um, um, it, it just provides more opportunity and uh, um, so that's that's it so if there's any other discussion from any board members okay all those in favor please signify by raising your hand um, student board member votes in the affirmative. Mr. Hancock, yes. Ms. Brown, yes. Mr. Lucas, yes. Ms. Wilson, yes. And Ms. McGraw, yes. All those opposed? 
Ms. Abel and Ms. Battle Lockhart. All right, so the motion passes. All right, thank you very much. Could I just have some clarification? Please, yes. As to when this will go into effect. Dr. Navarro? I, or? I am assuming the board wants it I'm assuming the board wants it to go into effect this school year. Yes. yes. So yes. Um, we have instituted an option um, to make sure that we provide, and Mr. Lee just walked in, that we provide um, a little bit of flexibility for the um, eligibility of students for athletics. Uh, for this fall because uh, practices begin officially tomorrow. Um, so we can, we can expand a little bit of, of the flexibility for that, but everything else we can institute based on how the board approved um, the changes to the eligibility. So it would okay. go into effect this year. Thank you. We just need to um, send some notifications right away. Okay, very good. And for the public's sake, you know, this is this is more than just athletics. This is this is in fact a lot more than just athletics. So, okay. Next on the agenda um, is new business. Is there any new business? Okay. Oh, Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman Lucas. Um, for future agenda items. Um, I know it was mentioned earlier about um, staff reviewing the uh, cell phone policy. I would like to see that as an agenda item sometime in the near future so that we can, and the public has an opportunity to, to review it and hear our thoughts and suggestions on how to move forward with that. Thank you. So, so yeah, 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 that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Um, so the cell phone, Eric, I'm looking at you for a second, sorry. The cell phone is not an actual policy. It is a rule on cell phones in the student code of conduct. Uh, it is not an actual policy. I believe the details are in the rule that, that we're talking about. The pol I think there is a board policy, but I think the rules uh, spell out the details. Okay. So just to be clear, Mr. Hancock, you'd like to, um, for the... All, whether it's in a policy with rules for that to be present so that we go through the actual language as it's stated right now correct okay and also um, and so when when an item like this comes forward um, potentially also discuss the how we're implementing that this school year and then discussions around potential uh, engagement for adjustments exactly yes yep thank you thank you Battle Lockhart, did you have something? Yeah, um, I, have a, I have a couple items. Um, based off of a lot of the things that was presented today, um, I, in Ms. Dr. Jones' um, safety and security um, presentation, is there a way I would like to see if we can get a presentation of the ISR program, of what that consists of, and what that, you know, th to better understand how, um, well that's well it's going or not going or like the benefit to um the students that are having to go into that's a behavior thing yeah it's not some, i mean so, that, that yeah presentation is fine I, I don't i don't see that as a safety and security issue but i mean the no, I, what no. a presentation that's that's no that's he reasonable. his presentation was on school safety um and discipline and so it falls in the area so to get a little bit more in depth if that's something you all are addressing i would like to understand because that's a program to support that right so, yes i i don't think we've ever had a presentation on that so i was just wondering if so we could a clear understanding of, of the program yeah sure if Do that's this data to support the success of it or not um the that, other okay i'm sorry just ahead. have so is that something the board? Yes, I would support it. Okay. Yep. Um, and to piggyback, I said this earlier, but I would 
want to add it to the agenda items. The tutoring data from that, Miss I'm gonna call it Miss M, so I won't mispronounce her last name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to see how effective it has been. Um, I guess we just used it over this summer for the first time. No, we actually started implementing the programs in March, yeah. so we have a little bit of data. Yeah. Um, I would say to me is not yet very strong data because we haven't used it across the board and one of the reasons we put it in and we're talking about it in starting here but what we're going to be talking to parents about is mm -hmm. we need more participation so we can follow up with that data yeah. point so future future <laughs> yep. Yep. um and two more items um Pesota, we was talking about Pesota. is i would like to um suggest that if we can have um the charter school, so for people don't know what Pesota is, um, do a presentation of the journey of where they are since they're due to be open next year, correct? Just so the community can better understand that process and where they are, so in the families that are supporting that, I, I think that would be a great idea. Okay. And last but not least, um, I know I missed a meeting or something, uh, um, so I, it may have been done already. I just wanted to understand where we were on the achieving, achieving academic equity and ex excellent with African American boys that was at Westlake. I know they completed it. Are we going to continue that or did we talk about how that went last year? We did not do a board presentation okay. spe specifically. If you like, we can do a board presentation that they are continuing their grant and they're expanding. Uh, we can do a board update or we can do a board presentation. I'll leave it up to the board. I'm open. I just wanted to get more details on. I know that the little, I saw the little graduation thingy or celebration, <laughs> but I just want to hear more about it. And that's it for me. Thank you all. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Madelockar. Ms. Uh, McGraw. Um, I recently had the uh, opportunity to sit in on two different meetings, one with the AIB and one on the state task force for um, blueprint implementation. And many of the county, we, we're one of the few counties that does not have um, information regarding the blueprint on their regular agenda, monthly agenda. And uh, I would like to see that happen either um, you know, report from the ta task force members or um, wherever we are in terms of implementing the, the blueprint. <clears throat> I know that there was a report that was put out by the Strong Schools, which um, Mabe does highly support. They're an advocate for the implementation, advocate for a number of things, but one thing is monitoring um, the implementation of the blueprint. And according to their report, we did extremely well, but one of the areas that we did have need some improvement in was community engagement, specifically disseminating information to the public on a regular basis. So my suggestion is, is that if it not be every month, every other month, have a presentation on the blueprint implementation. Okay. So I just want to yeah. get clarification on exactly what the board wants, whether they want to, so right now the board and the commissioners get a monthly um, update on the work of each of the subgroups that is having. Um, Strong Schools is advocating across all the LEAs that the boards have an, a standing agenda item regarding the blueprint. Um, I will tell you that not every month there's a lot of movement on issues of the, of the blueprint law. There's a lot of questions. Uh, I'll speak on behalf of the group that I am um, associated with, which is the superintendent group. And there's a lot of questions that we put forward to try to do any updates. So I just wanna, I just wanna get clarification from this board. Um, how you would like that update to be and how often you'd like that to be. Well, well I think the community, the community needs to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So bi-monthly for me would be, you know, acceptable. But I just think we need to impart that information to the community. Yeah. I, think, I think one of the challenges, and I can't remember, it may have been 
the subgroup that you, Ms. Wilson, and I, we had a meeting on. I, I, I've had so many the past couple months, but, but one of the issues was um, how counties report out and are they reporting in the same format, in the same way? Mm -hmm. And I, I think the answer is no. And, and so that, that, that's good in the sense that we can choose our own format, but, but not so good in the sense that the people, people always like to compare where you are so I think um, I'm, in my, I'm all for doing what you say but um, you know what exactly are we reporting out our, our, our achievement in each of the five areas of the blueprint or our progress in each of the five areas and, and I guess that's, that's mm -hmm. one thing the superintendent can investigate I don't know if, if, if your group of of superintendents have, have had this discussion as well on, on a format um, so there hasn't been a standard format although a couple of school districts have different pieces I mean we have the website um, that we that we do all of the updates through the website um, and we've been talking internally around continuing to bring um, throughout the school year community conversations and updates to, uh, regarding the blueprint um, as we mentioned before um, we I, I still think that there needs to be another joint work session between the Board of Education and the commissioners to continue more conversations about the blueprint um, and we need to discuss when that timetable makes sense um, but I'm I, I just want to just some clarifications because I agree I mean I think this is a question of how do we keep the community up to speed about what is happening particularly um, how often is one like this summer there was a lot of um, engagement to educate a lot of members around the depth of it but um, there are still some pieces that need to be clarified for action to happen in a lot of areas. Um, and there's been some clarification documents that, that have come forward. So I, I mean, I agree that, that you, can't, uh, you can't over communicate. My question is, how would the board, I mean, Ms. McGraw said, I, you know, maybe every hour of the month, and, and is it a presentation to the board, or is it a, something that we, that we disseminate to to the community so I, let me jump in I, I think I think both so I think it needs to be presentation to the board particularly as a new board comes um, comes here uh, it's going to be very important um, you know we, we get the presentation every month on our our CIP programs and and you know those are um, that's an easy snapshot to look at our progress so I think uh, I think just having something that addresses the five areas of the blueprint and, and that gives you a little freedom to, to present information at, as you see fit and, and as long as you continue in that same format every other month, it, every other month I think that will be good. Okay. And you mentioned something in your conversation um, that charged something. We, um, we did meet with the commissioners a few months ago about the blueprint, and, and I think we're, we're due another meeting. Um, so, so perhaps, perhaps at the same time when we have the meeting to the board uh, earlier earlier in the day, as we did before, we could have that meeting with the commissioners or even invite them. Mm -hmm. Ms. Battlewalker. So just for clarity, um, too, the report that we got, a, the same report, I was at the meeting as well, but um, what is it safe to act, look, those that are act, actually measuring or looking for the information to confirm, like with those people that's putting that together that says that we're not doing something <laughs> or is not included enough in our information, what exactly I mean, based on what we just shared, what else, where are they looking to say that we're not? Is it that what, that's what I will. Well, I, I just think, so um, 
So they're an advocacy group, and um, they are actually visiting multiple places throughout Maryland. They will be here in Charles County, I think, visiting later on in August. Their purpose is for the community to um, to be informed about the blueprint and, and really do advocacy. And so I think um, they see board meetings as, as yet another vehicle, as I, you know, as I see board meetings of sort of jump-starting and, and having community um, here regularly. And I think that's their ask. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's what they wanted to make sure that, that boards would consider, con you know, as Ms. McGraw said, continuously putting as, an, as a topic of what's happening. Um, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman Lucas. Um, to be fair, though, I, um, Chris Miller has done a really good job of educating all of us mm -hmm. on the blueprint. And um, I think, Dr. Navarro, you, you kind of touched on it. Um, you've done, uh, together, you've done some town halls to inform the public on, on the blueprint. Um, I'm okay with it. Personally, I mean, if we want to do it every month, that's fine. It, it could get a little mundane after a while. It's, it's, it's a lot, <laughs> unless we want to cover certain topics of it or a certain prog a progress report, how we're moving forward as, as we move ahead in it. But well, as I said, it, it doesn't need to be every month, but I really think it shouldn't be that the community has been informed and that's it. Because this is a long-term oh, sure. yeah. project. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know, generational yeah. reform right. that our, our um, community needs to understand is gonna have a huge impact on yeah. our schools. Sure. So, I, I, yeah, yeah I think it's a report from each work group every other month or, or whatever. We've got to keep it in the forefront because we don't want our community to say, oh, I didn't know anything about that. I knew it was coming, but that was my thought. Yeah. Well, let's let's uh, let's do the first one and then we can, you know, that that'll be to, to the people sitting here and then we can we can gauge um, if it needs to be in a different format and the frequency of it. Sure. That's a good, very good point, though. Start in September. Sure. Okay, anything else for future agenda items? All right. So um, we get a little break now um, un until 6 p.m. Okay. All right. Thank you very much and uh Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're going to continue with our meeting and first up as always in the evening is public forum. Mr. Schwartz. Thank you. I will read the rules for public forum. Statements should, uh, speakers should identify themselves. Statements should be brief to the point and limited to three minutes or less. Board members should not be expected to respond during the forum to statements made by speakers. Statements should relate to Charles County Board of Education agenda items or any education related topic with the following limitations. Personnel matters, pending or potential appeals, or the comments regarding the actions or statements of individual staff or the private lives of any individual are not appropriate topics. Proper language and decorum are required at all times. We have three speakers in person this evening. First speaker is Leslie Johnson. Hi, thank you. I'm very grateful for your time. This is my first public speaking. Hi, my name is Leslie Johnson. I am an upcoming senior in the class 2023 at St. Charles High School. A little bit about me is I have been on free or reduced lunch for as long as I can remember. Plus, I went from reading two years below my grade level to having over half the courses I take be on a college level. One of my biggest regrets in one of my biggest regrets as far as my education is only getting into things like this, meaning educating myself on policies and rules that affect people that look like me the most so late in my high school career. I am way more grateful than you know and can even imagine for your listening ears and open mind. Where I come from, we don't know 
we don't know how to speak AAVE, African American Vernacular English. Yes, we are all people. And too many people to not know how to speak on controversial topics such as dress code, eligibility, environmental friendly practices, and what has recently been brought up, accountability versus grace, etc. Especially, uh, specifically, my previous question about cell phone conversations confiscation is an example of professionally and respectfully asking a genuine question many were confused on. Since my first and second meeting this year, this is the first time I've heard anyone question a presenter on what they mean when they say safety roadshow assembly or my favorite quarterly meeting. I think obviously it goes without saying the board, parents, teachers all care about kids, but we oftentimes say we need to discuss this, we need to discuss that without ever actually talking about something. And then we end up spending millions or funding millions of hard earned money into programs and getting the same results. Like running around in circles, leaving us saying you're wrong, you're wrong, and you're wrong without really getting any. Why are well-spoken, <laughs> oftentimes presenters make a joke out of their own topics when they don't say what they're going to talk about, referring to fancy assemblies that are held in the same way, talking at kids, saying what is expected of them. I think that I don't come to you with solutions. I only come with the thought of how are we realistically going to start converse controversial dialogue professionally, as I have not seen it before. Is that good? Is that good enough for your students, for your children? I think not. Just a thought. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker Thank is you. Carl Greedy. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here for a couple different reasons. Um, I was contacted a couple weeks ago, or last week, by a uh, foreign exchange student um, that was interested in coming here and studying. She was kind of let down by her program, and they couldn't find a host family, maybe due to COVID, economic reasons. And through a friend of a friend, uh, we were put in touch and talked with her, and were interested in, in hosting her. Um, so I, I, kind of, I emailed last week to try to get some information from a few people, and I didn't get those returned emails like I thought I would, um, which seems to be more emails not returned by people in the school system than actually returned. Um, and I understand the time frame and people may be on vacation and stuff like that. But anyhow, I finally got in touch with the person who I was supposed to get in touch with um, today from the school system, and she said there was a deadline. I'm begging and imploring you that this deadline just might be extended. Um, I know that everybody always says there's room for one more kid, and you know then we end up with a thousand. I'm just looking for this one student to be admitted um, to North Point for this upcoming school year. Uh, very kind person. I, I she brings a lot of traits to the table that she went out on her own and tried to find a person, a host family to. Uh, be able to, to bring her over here and, and house her. And um, you know, she has a twin brother that's, that's getting housed in Canada. Um, I'm just looking for an exception. I, I honestly believe that this is gonna turn me into a parent that the 99% that, that don't wanna bother with doing anything in the school system, if this somehow just can't be done. Um, you know, I, I feel like I've put a lot of time in over the years. I didn't have time to write anything up like this lady did over here as, as nice as she spoke because um, I just got the answer today and it was lucky that there was a forum tonight. I'm just imploring you that you might find time to, to talk about whether this girl can be admitted or not. And I'm not looking to skirt any process of, of background checks or anything like that. I just want a chance for her to be admitted to Charles County Schools this year and hopefully to North Point so she can experience our culture and some of our kids might be able to experience what she brings to the table from Germany. It also brings something to my family because I have a lot of German heritage. Both my parents came from Germany. Uh, it's just me and my son that were born over here. Uh, I'm asking for an exception. I'm begging. I don't know what can be done. 
uh, uh, that's all I'm asking for. Uh, doesn't look like there's a long list. I'd be happy to talk to anybody afterwards if, if, you, if there's maybe some kind of solution we can find. Um, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Our next speaker is Chris Tomlinson. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Chris Tomlinson, uh, coach in the county, and uh, talking on the new rule that you guys just updated a few hours ago on eligibility. So first and foremost, thank you so much for taking a step in the right direction uh, by uh, reducing the GPA requirement from a 2.25 to 2.0 and allowing all freshmen to be eligible their first semester uh, to participate in both sports and extracurricular activities. Most of the time, if we don't get them into those uh, extracurricular activities as freshmen, we lose that opportunity for the duration of their, their high school career. Uh, so I really appreciate that. I'm sure the freshman uh, eligibility criteria will bring in hundreds more to each, each school uh, that are eligible for sports and extra, other extracurricular activities. However, um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if the underclass or upperclassmen are getting the same uh, allowances. So by lowering from a 2.25 to 2.0 at one high school, that's only one, it happened a few hours ago, that's the only one I could get information on, six, six total upperclassmen are now eligible because of that policy change, six. Not for one sport. Not for one class, not for sophomore class, not for junior, not for senior, six total. So we need to do better. And uh, I have a few recommendations that will increase the access that we have to extracurricular activities. So the proposed amendments I have are not new to the Southern Maryland area. Uh, they would be newer to Charles County, but are already in place in St. Mary's and Calvert counties. Uh, so first, I would remove the no failing grades caveat. Um, it is a current both CSM and, and St. Mary's County Schools policy. Uh, that would greatly increase the amount of uh, students that would have eligible to participate in those extracurricular activities in those sports, uh, as well as restoring summer school as an avenue to regain eligibility. Both St. Mary's and Calvert County both have these policies in place. These students, I don't know what uh, caused them to have issues for whatever reason to where they would need summer school, but if they put in that time and effort to get back on track academically, I believe they deserve a second opportunity to regain eligibility for all those extracurricular activities. <sighs> um, so I don't need to discuss any added benefits of any extracurricular activities, all the different skills that bring them to the table, getting more people interested and getting those kids a way to burn off some stress, uh, regain some, some mental health, find some inclusion, some new activities that would bring them into the school. Uh, I sent you very long emails that uh, I hope you read over the next coming days. <laughs> and, uh, but I just leave you with this. Urgent action is needed to implement those two changes so that we can have actionable change for this upcoming school year. If we don't make this change by a special session or special vote, we will lose the fall season for multiple sports in this county, multiple extracurricular activities in this county, and those students need that guidance, they need that help, and I really urge you to, to really look into this, try and make a special session, take a special vote to implement those two changes. Sorry, I'm getting a little, a little excited. I'm very passionate about this. Um, so again, thank you for your time, and uh, my contact information is in each of your emails. So f feel free to call, email me anytime. Um, and thank you for your time today. That was our last speaker. First thing is the minutes. Um, looking for a motion to approve the executive session minutes from the June 14th meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Abel, seconded by Ms. Wilson. Discussion? No discussion on okay. executive session. I'm sorry, thank you. You're correct. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Or raise your hand. That works too. Uh, next is the executive session minutes from the 22nd of June. So moved. 
Moved by Ms. Abel, seconded uh, by Ms. Brown. All those in favor, please raise. Okay. okay, it's everyone except for Ms. Battlelock or myself. We were not there. And then the regular session minutes from the 22nd of June. So moved. Second. Moved by. Uh, Wait a minute. You said for the 22nd of June. 27th. 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 Sorry. 27th or the 14th. Which one are we voting on? Hold on. 27th. 27th. Okay. I apologize. I wrote it down. Well, I could read my rhyming. 27th. The work session. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Wilson, seconded by Ms. Brown. Any discussion on the regular session minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your hand. It's everyone except for Ms. Battle Lockhart and myself who were not present. Next is personnel. I'm sorry, did we? I think we missed one vote on the minutes. Apologize, my board docs went down and I brought it up on my phone. What I have for minutes is, says the board will vote on executive session and regular meeting minutes of June 14th. I think you're right. So we missed the regular session meeting on June 14th, I apologize. So we need a motion for the regular session on June 14th. So moved, question. Second. Moved by Ms. McGraw, seconded by Ms. Abel discussion seeing none all those in favor please raise your hand that is unanimous vote except you. yeah all right thank you miss Abel so now on the personnel <coughs> move to accept second motion made by mr. Gross seconded by miss Abel all those in favor please raise your hand that's unanimous. Thank you very much. The daily and hourly wage rate. So moved. Moved by Ms. Sable, seconded by Ms. Brown. Any discussion? None. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. And finally, uh, the Posada Charter School Amendment that we heard earlier today. So moved. Second. Se moved by... Ms. Wilson, seconded by Ms. Sable. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. The student member does not vote on that, correct? All right. Thank you very much. Now, Chair will seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. By Ms. Made by Ms. Wilson and seconded by Ms. Brown. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you so much. Everyone have a good night. Stay cool. <laughs>